you know, I think you're going to actions that you might want to describe. All right. Okay. And we'd like to know what, what, what you guys did, what you were involved in, and what you saw as well. But starting from, I guess, Camp Hill and to go to Swift. Well, yeah, well, actually. Did they, did they start, start at Camp Hill? No. They started, we started in, Fort, in Camp Swift. Oh, okay. Uh, they give some sample questions here. Oh, sure. And some of the sample, they, they say to begin the interview by giving the subject of the interview, which is the discussion of the pioneers. All right. The date of the interview. All right. Uh, they also ask then for your information, who you are, the name, your name, the, your birth date. Um, I'll tell you your yeah, yeah, current address. <laughs> They, they ask for service information about you. Sure. I think it's just to catalog it, you know, um, okay. branch of service, highest rank. I can throw these things out to you and you can just sort of answer Yeah, them. as we get started. Okay. The one thing I wanted to let you know is I made copies and found this information in the Yank. I thought maybe you would be interested in it because the first one I opened was on the 10th. I've seen that. Did you really? Yeah. You basically got quite a I, in fact, I have, the, I have a so copy of it. Do you? Yep. And the other one I found, I'll, I'll just send that off to somebody else, was a casino. Now, I don't know if this actually has to do with the, the 10th. No, we have nothing to do with the casino. I just was in the 34th Division and was uh, came all the way from, he landed on North Africa, came all across with the 30, 34th across Africa, made the landing in, in Salerno in Sicily. Oh. Uh, went from Sicily into Italy, fought and moved up the, to uh, the Rapido River, which was the winter line where on, the casino was the big point. Right, right. And then his attack on casino, we got machine gun, and that was the end of it for the, for the war. Yeah, but he would be very happy. Okay, good. You give that to him. You bet. Okay. Now, I just want to show you these. I found these among my father's items. And in his own handwriting, this is that one before. Yeah. They took his car and built out to Colorado. Well, I just happened to know Bob, Stokes, Jim Gilronan, yeah. and Jack Rivard. Yes. Yes. When you come to Philadelphia, we'll have a dinner party with Gil Roman. <laughs> <laughs> and they were going back. They wanted to see hey, all this was after the war. I'll be dang. H A U P T. Johnny Stokes mm -hmm. and Jack Rivard. And I can't tell exactly. Is that your dad? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. All right. And that's that jerk, wonderful guy, Monahan. Yes. Right here. Mm -hmm. uh, these were tried and true friends. Weren't they really? They sure were. And you need to know they thought so highly of you. Them. You need to know that. Um, mm -hmm. Even when I spoke recently, I was with Gil Ronan, and I went, went down to visit Pat, and then I went down the road a little ways and spoke to Gil Ronan. And as long as I can remember, high regard for you. Well, they were. Thank you. They were. They were a great gang, and I. Uh, I was just proud to be with them. They were hellacious soldiers. <laughs> Well, they're just fun-loving guys right now. But, uh, well, sure, but yeah. they, uh, uh, believe me, they were fun-loving guys then, too. I, they looked it. <laughs> well, I, I, this is part of my story. That it was my great privilege to choose some of the guys that were in my uh, platoon. Well, why don't we get the yes. interview started? Let's okay. get it started. Uh, we're going to turn it on. Keep going. Okay. Oh, it's been on. Yep. Oh. I got all that. <laughs> Okay, I'm right. sneaky, what can I say? Okay, so, Jill, why don't you start and, and ask the information? Okay, do you want me to introduce myself? Mm -hmm. Okay, my name is Jill Hahn. I am the daughter of Robert B. Hahn, 85th HQ, 3. And I'm sitting here with Charles Hopman, who was my father's lieutenant during World War II, with the 10th Mountain Division, A and P Platoon. Is Am that correct? Ammunition and Pioneer Platoon, yeah. Ammunition and Pioneer Platoon. So, if you will, give us a little idea of how the 
AM, uh, ammunition and Pioneer yeah. platoon we have started. Start AMP. Okay, we have AMP then. And uh, if you would just start and explain because we're so interested in this and we wanted to go into the record because many people just never heard of this platoon. <laughs> well, in the first place, when we were in Camp Hale, we were, we were uh, what they call a light division. And the way a light division is set up is it only had the three companies, three rifle companies in the battalion. It didn't, it didn't have a heavy weapons company, for example. And it didn't, this, this A&P platoon didn't even exist because that, that A&P platoon was part of the headquarters company. So when, when we were all, all the time that we were in Camp Hale, there wasn't any such animal. But then we moved down to, to Camp Swift, and uh, when we were down there in September, I believe it was, and shortly thereafter, about the 1st of November, we were reorganized. And, in, and we went into the same teal, table of organization that an ordinary infantry regiment had. And in so doing, they created the fourth company in the battalion, which became the heavy weapons company. And they also added into headquarters company this ammunition and pioneer platoon, which I understand was part of a standard infantry uh, battalion, or, uh, battalion table of organization. So in, in doing all this uh, changing of things, I, I was chosen, why, I don't know, but anyhow, I got the job of being the pioneer platoon leader in the battalion headquarters company. And so I moved, I'd been in K Company as a uh, rifle platoon leader for, our, uh, well, since December 43, I was in K Company until November 44 when they did this reorganization. So I moved from K Company to, head, to headquarters company. So we had a very short period of time to train for the job that we were supposed to do. But first off, let me talk about these, some of these people, because when Colonel Sheeler gave me the word, and I was kind of proud to do it, that I was going to be platoon leader of the pioneers, he said, if you've got some men in the in K Company that you know you'd like to bring over to that, I said, that's great. I've got a few guys in mind, and most of them that I felt were kind of uh, renegades, but uh, that's all right. They were, uh, I can, I mentioned, you know, we were just looking at this picture about Monaghan. Yes. And uh, Monaghan was forever in the doghouse because he was, I don't, even, I don't see his name yet, Tom. Monaghan would, uh, he wouldn't salute the general when the general drove by in his jeep. He just waved, hi, general. And the next thing, thing I knew, they, they, uh, uh, He'd be on company, uh, what they call it, uh, anyhow, he was confined to the company things because of uh, it was sort of the, the lowest rate of uh, penalty that the commander or something could give him. And uh, I forgot what the, name, what the term for that was, but anyhow, Monahan was uh, often in that position. But I got to uh, take some of these guys with me from K Company that are on the list here, for example, Hal Asquith and uh, see, else here? Ray Makala and Monahan and Raj Newhall, he was from K Company. And Jack Rivard was from K Company. John Stokes was from K Company. I, I guess that's it. And then the rest of them were just uh, uh, like, like all uh, enlisted men were. They were just designated by people who were already in the battalion, the headquarters company, or, or were maybe they just uh, were assigned by some other of the companies to send some people over to headquarters to be in this thing. So a lot of them just uh, got into the into the company by, I guess you call it default. So are you saying my father wasn't a part of K Company? No, he was not, that I recall. What's his name? Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I'm trying to think. You know that, that list that I gave you of the uh, Christmas 
or no, did that? No, 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 no. That was that, no, no, no. The list I gave you was in, uh, in on the fifth of March. I think it was in '45. Right. No, but I have a list of the, of the headquarters company Christmas party in 1943, and your dad wasn't listed on that, so he wasn't in the company at that time. So I, where where Bob had been prior to being in the in the in this platoon, in our platoon, I don't know. Anyhow. Um, what else? Is okay. So then, because of that reorganization that we had at that time, uh, we really had to hustle to, to, to train to do the, the job description that, that we have, and uh, it got to, it, it was it was fast and furious. Most of the things that we they besides just the ordinary infantry training that these guys had had and that, and that I was uh, trained in too. Uh, we had a book on a pioneer platoon and so we learned by, I'd read one night and then we'd have a meeting and uh, whatever it was and the next day we'd, I'd teach you what I'd learned. But uh, we had some great deals. Now Jack Mockner, let me, let me talk about him. He was the, the uh, platoon sergeant. And he had, he had come to the tent as a member of the uh, cadre from... 27th Division. Yes, that's correct. That's my father. Yeah. He was a New, New York National Guardsman. And Jack was a, a very, very efficient guy, sort of quiet, quiet. but uh, he was one fine man, and he was a great platoon sergeant. And uh, I don't think anybody else there in the company could remember had been a, a, a cadreman except for Jack, and Jack had been in the in the uh, headquarters company of the battalion for some time. So he was assigned to the Pioneer platoon at the same time as the platoon was formed. And the job of the platoon was may, may I interrupt you for one moment? Fire away. Now this one this is the same one you gave me. Yep. Yep. So, so this is, document is that's in the middle of combat. Oh, okay. see, that's Jen. Right. That's oh, March forty-five. Right. right, I see. And this was my name's not on that because I was still in the hospital. You know, you get if you get hit, you're you're transferred to the detachment of patients, patients, and whatever hospital, and so you aren't even in the unit anymore. I see. And then when you're discharged discharge back to you if you're, can, you're fit for duty again. Then they'll discharge you and transfer you from the hospital back to your unit. So Sorry. I wasn't even on the roster here at that time. I'll make a notation. Okay. The reason why. So can we go back to when you were forming, you said that this man came in, what was his name, Jack Mockner? Jack Mockner. John Mockner. M-A-U-T-N-E-R. -E and okay. he, I understand, is from Long Island. I don't I've been trying to run down some of his relatives or children I, or what. I can, I can actually help you with that. Good, yeah, good. I, I would really like to know. It, I, feel, I feel very, very remiss that I haven't done this much earlier because uh, Jack Mautner's death in Italy was absolutely inexcusable. So why don't we go back to the forming of this group? Jack Mautner was the platoon sergeant. He was the platoon sergeant. Yep. And then you read your book and taught them daily. Yeah. A lot of the things that, uh, much of the things that we did, well, first place, our, our mission uh, as a pioneer platoon was our ammunition. We were uh, responsible for providing to the rifle company the animal that they needed. And uh, this is by backpack or, or using mules as we did in, in, uh, in Italy. And, so that was a, that was a thing. We worked with the uh, what was he the S4? That's the supply officer of the battalion, and he told us where we needed to go and what we had to set up. Uh, what do you want me to tell you about what we did in combat, or, or yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Let's let's fin let me finish so with this in in Camp Swift where we were, we were working. Uh, a lot of our stuff. I mean, Pioneer, on the Pioneer side, we were the equivalent of 
the battalion engineers. We were supposed to be able to build uh, bridges, small bridges, road bridges, stuff like that if need be, uh, repair, minor repairs on roads. The big thing we ended up doing in Italy is mine removal and getting the uh, rifle uh, companies through the minefield and explosives and demolitions. In other words, we, we used that presumably to blow up anything, sneak out and blow up a bridge or something like that, which we never had to do. But uh, we, had, we had a great practice of one night in, uh, in Camp Swift after we'd uh, been teaching them how to make uh, primers out of blocks of TMT. And they learned how to use explosive uh, crimp caps and all those little basic things that you do in handling explosives, how to keep cap your caps apart from your high explosive and that sort of stuff. And after we practiced this on wooden blocks of explosive, I, I figured we ought to have some training in the real thing so I requisitioned a whole box, a whole bunch of uh, TNT, and, and one night after about dark, uh, we all loaded up in a in a six by six truck, and I'd seen a a, a, a wooden a, a timber bridge that the engineers of the regiment had been building out on the training field. So we had a great operation. We sneaked up on the bridge and uh, put all the explosive charges where they need be and acting you know, as if we were under the observation under fire in the dark. And we fired them up and took off. And of course the bridge just went up in a, it was a beautiful timber bridge. <laughs> and uh, so we loaded up the truck and went back and everybody went to bed. And about the next day came a directive from the, from the division looking for whomever was responsible. Looking for whomever was responsible for blowing up the uh, division engineer bridge, which is under construction. <laughs> it was a it was a it was a wonderful uh, <laughs> it was a, it was a wonderful uh, training exercise. Uh, that's, that's, that's what we did. Of course, we remember, we didn't have very much time because we shipped out uh, the first of the year. So we had about six weeks, really, of uh, training on, on Pioneer stuff. And then we were supplied. We had we had chests of, uh, for the Pioneer platoon of uh, tools, axes, rope, saws, all that sort of stuff for things that we, we might need. That was part of our equipment and backpacks. I mean, that's what we got the most out of when we got overseas. And some of these guys, they earned their, they earned their stripes pumping ammunition up to the, up to the front. Okay, what else do you need to? Oh, okay. you know, may I just add something yeah. there? Sure. I, that's very true because my father stated that, that that's one difficult thing. They really, they, I think they slept during the day, That's right. and then they took it up and they dropped it at certain places, going up the mountain. Yep, that's exactly and right. He said that was pretty tough. They carried pretty much. <laughs> oh, they had a lot of weight on those backboards. Okay, so you formed this out at Camp Swift, Camp and then you Swift. got your orders, and you went to take yeah. the boat over. Now, when you took the boat over to Italy, yeah, uh, were you all in the same section on the boat? Or? Yeah, yes. And what was that like? Pure hell. Pure hell. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, it, that, that uh, ship that we went over was the USS America, which had been the liner of the United States. And uh, we had 14,000 troops on that ship, and which included all, uh, all the division except a couple of battalions, or one battalion of the 86. And we had a a USO troop and some, some uh, Red Cross people, but mostly it was just all the ten. And uh, we went over without escort because that ship was much faster than the subs or the uh, uh, you know, uh, convoy, which had to go at the speed of the slowest ship. Wasn't that dangerous? 
Well, that was the beauty of being fast. That, uh, that ship traveled about 30 knots, I understand. We had, a, uh, we had one sub, uh, what do you call it, alert. Everybody had to quick get on board, uh, out on the deck and put on the May West. But uh, actually, we went over in such a horrendous North Pacific storm, winter storm, that uh, I can't imagine anybody trying to sneak up on us. That uh, ship rolled unmercifully. It was over 30 degrees. Because we had a in the in this uh, what do you call it a uh, stateroom stateroom. Yeah, it was made for two people, and there were 12 of us, 12 officers in there. And then somebody nailed a, a compass uh, thing on the wall and hung a string, and that ship was listing 30 degrees this huge ship in fact it would it would roll over here and then it would slowly come back and it would roll over here 30 30 degrees so as you'd be walking along the passages you pretty soon you'd be walking almost on the wall here and the next thing you knew you're falling off of it because you have to go on the other side but as a result about half of the people on board were sick seasick and uh, in fact, I saw some guys, that, one of them was a, one of the mess sergeants that had come over with uh, Cadre, and he'd, he'd been on, on board the ship and went to Hawaii, but... He knows me. Huh? He knows me. Monahan? He was in, no, no, he was a headquarters company... Chef? Uh, cook. cook, yeah. And, okay. But anyhow, as he walked up... And, Gangplank. When we went up to that ship, it was just a great gray wall. We walked through a door in, this, in the ship under this uh, shelter where we'd been, uh, uh, what they called a shed uh, at the port, and it was raining, grisly day, miserable cold. But as we walked up this gangplank into that ship, this guy heaved over the edge of the gangplank. He was seasick just looking at that thing. So, anyhow, when we got on, and after about 48 hours, this Half of the men on the on the ship were violently seasick, and the conditions were just awful. Uh, you can imagine they, they call them ladders, but they're stairways, and especially down near the near the uh, mess halls, which the smell was got pretty bad. So the, the stairways were slick with vomit, and and, and uh, I, I, as a, all junior officers, you had to spend. The men were down in these, we call it the hole, because this, the overhead was only about seven feet high, but there were four bunks in there, so these, your dad and all these other folks were lying there, and when they lay on the, on the, on the bed, their nose was about three inches from the rump of the guy up above him. And, and these were, between the rows of bunks in the, below where these men were, it wasn't more than 20 inches I know, something like that. And every other guy bunk was occupied by a sick man who was heaving into his helmet, which was hanging at the end of his bunk. So, you know, that was kind of miserable. So uh, I spent eight hours of every day down in there because they had to have somebody on, on duty on these troop things. So the trip over was anything but pleasant. Can I ask you who was, you said you were in a bunk stateroom for two people, but you really had 12 men in there? Yeah, 12 officers. Could you tell me who some of those men were? Do you remember? Well, one of them was the father of the, of the, uh, must the name must have been Fields, because I couldn't remember his name. Yeah. And, uh, and his father Captain was... Captain Fields? Yeah. He was uh, the chaplain? Yeah. He was the Protestant chaplain. The Catholic chaplain was... Uh, Charles Gordon. Was he on it? Uh, he was on board, but I he, I don't recall whether he was in our in our uh, room or not. No, I. Anybody else? Other Schiller, than, or how, about, how about your colonel? Was he in there too? No. No. The only thing I remember about, him, and I didn't know his name, and I know what now he was. That my, I had spent my eight at one time. I remember I was a second lieutenant. I thought maybe permanent grade, but anyhow, it was some of the goofy things that I got. To, I, I, anyhow, um, 
after I'd spent my eight hours down in the hole under one day, and my relief didn't show up, and that 15 minutes I was steaming, and finally, after half an hour, I went charging up to find out where this yo-yo was that was supposed to replace me. And the door to this stateroom was shut, so I just banged it open, and I barged in, and I said, where in the hell is and this guy sitting in the middle of the room in a chair all by himself with a book, which I sort of shortly found out was a Bible. And he, he just looked up at me and he said, that's 25 cents, Lieutenant. And I said, what the hell are you talking about? That's 50 cents, Lieutenant. I said, good God, let's go. That's 75 cents. Whoa, 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 what's going on here? And he said, have you read the sign on the door? I said, what sign on the door? And I think I swore again, it cost me another time to do it. <laughs> so I looked at the door, and here was this little tiny hand-printed sign that said, between 9 and 10 o'clock a.m. is the chaplain's hour. There will be no swearing and no talking, and uh, everybody will be quiet. So I said, God, and no, that's another 25 cents. I said, this is getting expensive. What's going on? And he said, that's what I mean, the sign, and you, you just better not be in, have any more swearing. So uh, uh, finally, this other guy did relieve me, and I got to run out of the room as quick as I could, because it was costing me real money. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was Captain Field? I'm sure it was. He was, uh, he was the 3rd Battalion, I mean the 3rd, the 25th Regiment, Protestant chapel. We had a, a rabbi, a Protestant, and a, and a Catholic chaplain, and they were each assigned to the separate battalions for rations and quarters. And uh, Padre uh, Gordon was assigned to the third battalion. He's the guy I knew best. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you arrive in Italy. Mm -hmm. You finally got off that ship. Yep. And you arrive in Italy. Where do you arrive? At Naples. You arrive in Naples. How long did you stay there? We got there in the afternoon. We stayed on the ship uh, overnight. The next morning we got off the ship, walked down the pier about uh, 300 feet, and got onto an LCI, Landing Craft Infantry. And Do you know the date? December or January? Well, let's see. We left, we left uh, uh, Newport, or Patrick, uh, Camp Patrick Henry in New, uh, Newport. Uh, on the 4th of January, and it took us nine days to get to, to, uh, to Naples. So that would be 13th? the 13th, yeah. So 13th of December? No. January. 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 45, okay. yeah. Now, because I turned, I turned 23 on the 5th of January. We had a nice, nice birthday. Uh, oh, yeah, we went to Camp Pat. And that was a lovely thing, so our, our battalion arrived at Camp Patrick Henry on New Year's Eve, 1940, I, I don't mean the Christmas Eve, 1944. We pulled into the station there at 11 o'clock at night. It was cold, miserable, raining. We got off the train and formed up. And we marched out there, I'll be home for Christmas, was playing on the, on the PA system there at the station. That chance. So we got, to, anyhow, up there in, in, in Naples, we got aboard the uh, LCI. And we left uh, Naples about, well, I guess about 8 o'clock at night. And it was an overnight trip, and I remember my bunk was down near the engine, right next to the engine that pounded and stunk of diesel fuel. And also they had a bunch of stores, food and stuff, behind a uh, wire mesh screen. This was an American ship, but they had been supplied by the British. And a lot of it was old mutton. That mutton did, I can't stand the taste of mutton or sheep or anything about it today. It was so awful. That's what my dad said. That's what oh. We never had that, ever. It was just awful stuff. <laughs> but uh, during, the, uh, with, during the night, uh, 
uh, we stayed very close to the shore to avoid subs which were out there in the Mediterranean. And the, the Italian shore was almost totally black, except once in a while we'd see a little, little point of light. But I had one of the most wonderful experiences in my life because they, we couldn't stand to be downstairs, so we were all sitting up on deck trying to watch the, see if we could see anything on, on coast, which we could or anything, but about sometime in the middle of the night we're sitting there, all these guys around me and we're yakking about what the war going to be like, what, the, what might be expected of us. And I don't know who it was, but one of these guys, and I think they'd had their head together and they came up, and this guy came up and he said, Lieutenant, he said, uh, we don't want you to get shot up if we can help. And he said, is it all right when we get up on the line, uh, or there might be some German, if we call you Chuck, and I said, that's the greatest, you bet, that's the greatest compliment I've ever had. And he said, well, we'll, we'll always remember the salute you when we're back where we're in the rear area. But he said, up on the line, we're going to call you Chuck. And I said, suits me. I like that. So then we, I mean, uh, we got to Leghorn, and I don't know how they th threaded their way into that Hey, uh, sure like that fellow. Uh, our way into that harbor at Leghorn because it was just cluttered with sunken ships. Just, there were masts sticking up everywhere. They got us on a port. And uh, we stayed there in uh, what was the, uh, the King's Hunting Ground, I think they called it for about uh, two two days while we sort of at you. got things. Yeah, you were all dressed up. I, was, <laughs> I dressed up three hours ago. I got <laughs> Thanks, Chuck, for all that help. That was great. You're welcome. You're, I appreciate it. Who is this right here? You know what we're doing in the interview? Oh, oh, are you no kidding? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> So what they're doing is telling you to shut up. <laughs> you know, on the dad I gave you on my descendants, yes. I made a mistake. Okay, can we get... Can, can we, you correct, correct it? Can I do it a little bit later? Can I do it at dinner? If I'm sober. Okay, I'll get you dinner. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'll look for you. All right. Okay. <laughs> so you came into Lake... What was Lake... Well, we called it Lake Horn. Leghorn, how do you spell it? L-E-G, like a leghorn chicken. Oh, okay. Only that's the G-I thing. It, actually, the town is Liborno. Okay. L-I-B-O-R. And that's near pizza. Yes. That's the carver near pizza. Okay. That's exactly right. Okay. And then so we went into Pisa, uh, or just on the outskirts of Pisa, the, to this, uh, well, it had been the, the king's, what do you call it, uh, hunting ground. I know they had, the, the place had giant, big, beautiful pine trees and rows of them that had kind of funny looking uh, crowns on top of them. Almost looked like palm trees, but they weren't that. They'd been trimmed. And the army was busily cutting down these glorious big pine trees. They had a saw in there, and they were cutting them down to make timber, lumber for the army. I imagine that made some very unhappy Italians. But anyhow, uh, we were there for three or four days, and then we drove up to the town called Tronetta, which is a neat little town, sort of in the in the rear, went in a sort of reserve. And the night we got there was uh, again it was cold and snowy, and, and uh, we were the pioneers were bunked in a house down the road from the uh, Italian the, the house that was taken over by the Italian headquarters. See, the pioneers were always right under the thumb of Colonel Sheeler and, and uh, our, our company commander. They wanted us right handy for all sorts of odd jobs. Who was your company commander? Company commander was Otto Brown. Otto Brown. O, o T T O. Mm -hmm. He was a, had been a forest ranger at Yellowstone Park. So anyhow, we, uh, moved into this house and on the second floor of the 
was this house. There was a kitchen that uh, it didn't have any the stove. There wasn't any stove. It, they cooked in the fireplace. And I remember the ceiling of the kitchen was, was a bunch of poles laid close together. And there were piles of chestnuts up there. That's how they cured their chestnuts and dried them uh, with the heat from the kitchen and the smoke because they ground up chestnuts to make flour. And uh, in any event, uh, we were there that night and somebody found a whole bunch of wine there. And a whole gang of us got royally drunk. <laughs> Not my dad. Yes, your dad. Oh, I can't believe it. <laughs> and the, the next morning, uh, that, was a, that, that was a beauty. I, I, Whenever I was there at all, I was with these guys. And we were often fired, sent out to other places. And that was always as a, as a, as a unit. So. How many rooms you in? Well, I just counted 28. 28? Yeah. And so it was made up of you. Were you a captain or a lieutenant? I was a, at that point, I was a second lieutenant. And would have been, so how would it have broken down? Would have been a lieutenant? Well, we had, we had, uh, Three squads. Three squads. Yeah. And who would have headed up those squads? Well. Were you ahead of the whole thing? Yeah, I was a platoon leader, and Jack Mautner was a second command. He was a platoon sergeant. Right. And then each, uh, let's see, who the. Would there have been an officer in charge of them, or no, would it no, have the, been a sergeant? The three squads, uh, let me see, who the hell were they? Well, later on it was, it was Hell, Asquith, and. So you would have been the only officer in this room? Yeah. Well, how many people were in a squad? About uh, seven. Seven in Seven, seven eight. And yeah. it would have been headed up by a, a sergeant? Sergeant, yeah. Uh, and right off the bat, Jim Gilronan, he was assigned uh, a truck and a driver, and he hauled ammunition. And he was almost directly under the command of our, our S-4 who was, uh, here we go with names again. Anyhow, he was another lieutenant. He was S-4 as the supply. Uh, he's in charge of supplies for the, for, the, for the regiment. And since we, it was our job to provide the ammunition, Jim, this lieutenant would, would take Jim and they'd go back to a dump, an ammo dump, and bring that up. And then my guys would load up their Backboards and that sort of thing, or mules, whatever we had at the time. Was it yeah. Dunn? Bill Dunn? What? Sergeant Dunn? Was he the one that Gil Ronan reported to? No, this guy was a lieutenant. Oh, it was a lieutenant. Okay. No. Okay. I can't think of his name at all. Okay, well, we'll come. Yeah. Now, would you describe, when you're speaking of board, what kind of board is it? Backboard? Yes. Well, it's a, it was a molded. Looked like wood, but it was a composition thing, and it was had lacing across it so that it rested against your back and sort of fit your back a little bit com com comfortably with uh, with shoulder straps. And it had uh, straps on the sides of it, but you whatever put your load on, then you strap it on and tie it. I mean, uh, strap it down. And how much did that weigh when it was? Well, it depends on what they put on. If they, uh, I would dare say that whatever they. There was probably around 50 or 60 pounds. Uh, if, they, uh, if they carried, uh, you know, three three cans of uh, machine gun ammo, or uh, maybe six rounds of mortar ammo, that would be about a load. And then they they just <laughs> they were human mules. Uh, Did they carry in crates? Huh? Ammunition in crates? Well, that's what I mean. It uh, it was a. Uh, Mortar ammo came in a tube about this big along, big around and about yay high. That's a 60 millimeter mortar round. 81 for about this long and that big around. And, and you just strap these, you put, put a pile of these, put your backboard down flat and put their, their tubes on the, on the backboard and then you strap that on, cinch it down tight. Mm -hmm. And then you pick it up and struggle into the straps and when you, everybody's loaded up, you hike up the hill. Uh, <laughs> okay, where, where are you 
were that you were. Um, oh, you I, at, 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 at Yeah, you, yeah. You're, oh, you yeah. had your three squads. You were in this house where you um, they had chestnuts where you got yeah. inebriated. <laughs> yes, we did. And we're then trying to figure out. And, and, the, and the next morning, no? oh, well, then the next morning, I was summoned to the uh, uh, headquarters, and I was and another lieutenant from the from the regiment were put in charge of a detail of men. They had selected two men from every company, plus uh, a number of men from the Pioneer Platoon to go to. Uh, Oh, I know this from the regiment. So we had two or th two men from every company in the regiment, plus men from the Pioneer Platoon in each battalion, and the two officers and I, the other officer and I. And it was, I know it was two truckloads of men. And we this was then we had no more and gotten to Grenada. Then we were to report down to Caserta, which is halfway between Rome and Naples, way south. We had two days to get there and to go to Mine and Demolition School, the Army Mines and Demolition School, which was at, at as I said, Caserta in what had been the Pope's summer palace. And the Fifth Army was occupying that as a headquarters. So we spent uh, a little over two weeks down, well, down in Caserta, learning all of us to know about primarily mines because we had learned nothing in the states. We didn't really have much in our in our books about the mines that the Germans used. So it, that was wonderful training and something that we would have been in serious trouble if we didn't have. So after two weeks down there, then we came back, <coughs> and by that time, the uh, battalion had already been up on the line for a while. And when we came back, we went back to Prunetta. And immediately, uh, the other two guys, who were they from the battalion, the platoon, we immediately started serious training with about German mines and their German demolition. And so one of the things that uh, I had them do, I asked the folks and people there in the, in the Prunetta, I said, you know what, I the guy interpret, you know any place where there's still some German mines? And the guy said, sure. So he led us down the road. We took all these guys and we went down the road about maybe three or four miles from Granada. And he pointed, there was a switchback on this on this road, which there are a jillion crooked roads there. But anyhow, I said, right in there. And so we started on the road and uh, these guys, we had, a, had it set up. We did get it set up, Jack and I. We'd send a, a, one about a squad of half a dozen of these guys up. The rest of them stand back. And they got down on their hands and knees with a bayonet, and they started probing, looking for mines. And we did find them. And so they learned on the job about disarming. These were primarily uh, German teller mines, which are round anti-tank mines. They'd blow the track clear off of them. And then interspersed in there were anti-personnel mines, which they also learned to, uh, to disarm. So, you know, on-the-job training with the live stuff. So that got everybody's attention. And then our next assignment shortly thereafter, this, this would have been uh, January to around the 1st of February, something like that. And this is when we're doing this training. Then. Uh, knew, knew about this coming uh, business and at, uh, up there near Belvedere, so the pioneers were sent up a week ahead of our Belvedere attack. And we lived in a barn in a little house down in the bottom of the valley below Vidya Chiatico. And we, this is when we worked nights and slept days. And so we'd stay down there and bunk down in the hay and all that sort of stuff in the daytime. And then as soon as it started to, die, started to get day, uh, dark, some mules come up uh, from our friend here today. Um, 
Norman. Cummins, whatever. He'd send a bunch of mules up, and the, and the trucks had come up to where we were staying and dropped off a lot of ammo. So then we would load up the ammo. These guys would load up their pack boards, but also load up the mules, and then we'd go up in the dark, up to the base of, uh, of uh, Belvedere, and we'd pick this hunted around there and find a spot that looked like a good place to build a forward ammo, ammo dump. And that's where we piled all this ammo that we'd carried up. And we did that, and we'd come back. We did that for every night for a week prior to Belvedere. And it got pretty spooky because we never knew that the Germans might have with their patrol back and forth up there, and that they had, might have found our dump and would ambush us the next night when we came up. So it got progressively spooky every night because they had had more and more time to find our dump and lie and wait for us. Well, fortunately, it never happened. But it kind of just it used to worry us because these Italian mule packers were very good. Their mules were a little, kind of little critters, but they hauled a lot of, a lot of weight. And there was one mule led by an, an Alpini. And so they would follow us up to where we wanted to go. And then they had, they had something about their packs that our American mule packers didn't know about. Apparently because the Italian mule packers had, had a lot more experience, I swear. But when they got where we wanted them, all they'd have to do is jerk one strap on that pack and everything fell, fell, fell off with one hell of a noise. And that's what we've been trying to avoid all the time, to not make any noise and alert the sentries up above us or the or the or any possible German patrols. Well we got lucky and apparently they never they never found us, but uh, they every, before every attack, that's what we did. We built a forward ammo dump as far up as we could go without uh, alerting the enemy. So that was our pre, uh, pre-attack job. Then, at the time of, of the assault, and this is this is on started with the first time on Belvedere, is that uh, at least two, but something most often three, of the men from the Pioneer Platoon were assigned to each rifle company to clear paths through the minefields so that the infantrymen could go through because we ran into mines like you can't believe. We had lots and lots of money. And uh, so that, of course, on any assault, that reduced the size of the Pioneer Platoon to about half. And the rest of them would be uh, assigned the job of packing ammo. And generally, the, the way that re usually happened is the two rifle companies who were assigned to the job Two and two attacking companies and one in reserve. And the Sheeler, the uh, Italian commander and staff, were right in the middle of the triangle, the head of the bus, the uh, reserve company. So as we go up the mountain with the two companies moving up ahead, and with the two or three pioneers ahead of them, feeling in the dark for trip wires or on the ground first, looking for S mine, which was called bouncing betties. There were three wires that stuck up above the ground. That's all you could see because the mine itself was about as big as a one-pound coffee can, about yay high. And then this fuse stuck up out of the top of these three wires. That's called an S mine. Um, we call them bouncing betties because if you stepped on it, they were very stiff. And you stepped on that wire, it pushed it down pop, and then within a second, the inside of that can popped up out of the ground about uh, shoulder high and exploded. And inside that thing about this big around, there were 300 pieces of either chopped off quarter inch pieces of quarter inch rebar or steel ball bearings. So when this thing blew up four feet off the ground, there was just a shower of of steel came out of that, so it was a very nasty thing. It, it was it was the one thing we feared most was that 
S mine. But they also had to look for shoe mines, S-C-H-U, which were little wooden box things that had a quarter of a pound of TNT in them, and if you stepped on that, you were guaranteed to lose your leg up to your knee. And uh, then they had what was called stock mines or concrete mines, and they they set on a they drove a post like a like a about a three foot piece of uh, broom handle, pound that in the ground, and then this con uh, cast concrete thing that was cast with a lot of chunks of metal in it was set over the top of that post and in this hollow inside that thing was a some TNT and the fuse on that stuck up out of the top and then they would string a wire 30 or 40 feet from that that fuse so the guys that were going ahead they had to feel the ground keep to keep their eye if uh, use a bayonet and, and prod ahead because they had these these shoe mines were being wood they didn't they, they couldn't find them very well with the, the metal that they, you had to find them by, by, by probing so these pioneers moving ahead and, and happening on the velvet here in the dark feeling the ground if they felt loose ground then they would feel for these shoe mines and then they move ahead and then they feel up both above them for wires. Now if, these are kind of details, but if the wire's tight, you dare not cut it. And uh, all these guys carried pliers for cutting wires and they also had a whole bunch of, we, we made, uh, made a big, uh, uh, like a safety pin out of stiff wire and on that we put, uh, made, other pieces of short wire with loop in the end so we could hang them on this safety pin. So we had a lot of these wires there for, for uh, uh, safety wires because when the Germans set these things, they took the safety wires out so that if you pushed on them, they fire. So our guys, when they find these things, they take them these wires and put it in the safety thing and bend it so that it wouldn't fire. And uh, anyhow, so this is. Uh, this was really tricky, and then they also carried white tape, rolls of white tape about an inch square. And as they'd go along and feel, they'd lay it down. Most of them would do it on their hand or on their belly. And they'd lay this white tape on the ground, and that was the signal, the indication to the guys, the infantry were behind them, that this was a safe pass to follow through the minefield. And uh, believe me, they, they stayed right on that path. And uh, so this, this is what the pioneers did. Once they got them through the mine fields, by well, then they just became a rifleman with the, with the rifle company. Can, can I ask a question? You said that say, when they were going up Belvedere, uh, you would have had two companies going up. Like but, two companies going up. Would that be like A and K? Yeah. And then the, the pioneers would be in front of them? Well, they, 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 them? yeah, they, they were, they, they led the companies through the mine fields. Right, and then when you, but this is what you did to get to the top of Belvedere. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wow. And uh, oh no, that's did you lose any men going up Belvedere? Uh, there were there were three or four that were wounded and nobody killed. So you didn't have any mines take any of your men out. Didn't have what? You didn't have the mines that men hit the mines that blew them up or anything or killed them. No, they didn't. They didn't trip any mines. They didn't trip it. No. no. At You're least, right? well, at least my guys did. Your guys did not. No. Uh, some of the other, uh, well, I was I was uh, hit just before daylight out there because I was with the, with the colonel in the middle. I'm trying to think. It was I Company and L Company. No. Yeah, I Company and L Company were the assault companies. K Company was in reserve that night. And. Uh, my guys were, were following the reserve, uh, following K Company with extra ammo. And Jack Mautner was with them. The colonel wanted me on the assault right with him so they could tell me to go bring my guys here or we needed, mm -hmm. they needed more more people on, uh, for mines or something like that. Or well, what happened often is, is that our guys, once somebody got hung up in a minefield, 
got wounded or something of that to get them out. I could, our guys were sent to do that. Anybody, we, we, you became litter bearers then? No, we weren't litter bearers exactly, but we dragged, went by, we went in and, and, and fell our way into the minefield, got the wounded man and Finally. tried to drag him out the same way we came in and then the litter guys would pick him then up. Then the litter guys would take him up, take him to the main station? Yep. Okay. And how long did it take you to get to the top of Belvedere? Well, we left this, this uh, line of departure, which was a, a road that came from uh, uh, Corchova around the Gaza, Montana. We left that, uh, we crossed that line of departure at 11 o'clock at night. Was that on the 18th or on the 19th? That's the, the evening of the 19th. The evening of the 19th. February. And, uh, we were on top by, oh, before daylight. Before daylight. Yeah. But uh, in my case, I was with, uh, let's see, uh, George Dorrington was the S-2, I believe he was. He's a captain. He was a president. Uh, he was the uh, sort of battalion exec. And uh, we, George and I, were with Colonel Shearer. And we, everybody's crawling up, and there's lots of machine gun and, and mortar fire. Because these uh, tracers were just streaming over our heads. There was flat on the ground. And uh, we came upon this column of men just uh, head to toe. And she was just uh, uh, going to help them get those men up on top. Well, I don't know who they were, but I think they were. Elk or maybe I come and got men. Anyhow, they were just just frozen there, and rightly so, I think, because it was it was really hell. That uh, you see these pictures of the guys crawling and training under machine guns that are safely protected. Well, we were underneath machine gun fire, which is about 18 inches off the ground, crossing right over our heads, doing this sort of thing. So. Uh, George and I just took off sliding up on our belly past these guys and got up ahead of them and said, come on, follow us, which they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, George and I did our bit, tried to. And where was Jim Barr in this? How did he fit in this? Because he was... Well, I read Jim Barr and he... He, uh, he was S3, was he? Yeah. Okay. I think it was S3 or S2. I don't know. Uh, he was an intelligence officer. Exactly. Would he have been involved in this? He, he went, he, he led I Company up to short, above the, the, the uh, line of departure ways, and then my good friend, uh, uh, Butch Luther, told him to, he, okay, we'll take it from here, and, and Jim backed off. And then Butch, I think that's why those I Company people that I saw that were, that were getting nowhere, because Butch had just gotten up on top was promptly killed. Uh, yep, he uh, he was pinned with him right between the eyes. So he's killed on. So was he the and Butch Luther? What was his position? Was he, he was I Company him? commander. He was I Company. Who would have taken over for him? I think Ken Eggleston did. Was wasn't Eggleston in in L Company? Well, he was in L, and then he was also in M. But I. Well, Ken Eggleston took was replaced uh, April the twelfth and went to M Company April the 12th. My father took over for Ken Anderson. I, uh, yes, but... Uh, but who would have no, been... Oh, wait a minute, no. April... Was it England? No, no, that was on, that was on, uh, on 9-13 when, uh, that was on the 14th of April. Yeah, it was later that was in... Yeah. But anyway, I don't want to hold you up. I just thought maybe you knew who replaced him. Who replaced him? Uh, Luther. Luther? Seen, but I, uh, I think it's a new name. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Who was company to the I know K was what? Cooper. K right? was Cooper. Right. Cooper. Cooper. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And but I don't know who I company was. Well anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. So you got to the top of the mountain. At about 11 o'clock. Well, no, 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 no. no. We got it. We got it. Early morning. Yeah, early. That's what it would be. No? Yeah. 
You start at what, at 11 o'clock? We start at 11 o'clock at, at night. night. Yeah. And you got there early morning. And, uh, yeah, they, we were on top there by uh, 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock. Something like that. What did you do when you got up there? Well, I no more than gotten up on top, and uh, George Dorings and I were flattened out against the side. We'd been... There was a machine gun... Uh, 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 machine gun position up above us. George and I got there and so he and I sneaked up to it as far as we could do and it was very steep and there was a slot that they were firing out of. And so I got on my knees and heaved a grenade up and it, because uphill it hit short and then hit and started immediately rolling back down and rolled right down between us. And exploded right behind us. George told me later, said, you son of a bitch, you tried to kill me then. <laughs> I, and he said, I could feel still, and this was 20 years later from the division of California. He said, I can still feel the slap of that grenade against the bottom of my feet. But uh, anyhow, I got one in after that, and the machine gun quit. But then we the whole hillside exploded. We came on the most tremendous mortar barrage you could imagine. It was, there was just, you couldn't distinguish between bursts. It was, and it went on and on. Who was firing them? Germans. The Germans were firing on you. But weren't there old men on top of that hill? No, they pulled off the back. Oh, they and so we were just Americans up there. I thought it was. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, we were plastered against which, against which I thought was a, was a rock outcrop. But Last time I was over there, I realized that wasn't a rock outcrop at all. That's the that's the ruined basement or the base of what had been a, a, a little little church up on top of a monastery or a right, church, there something up there. Yeah, it was a ruin. There's a ruin. Yeah, there's a ruin up there. But it's wiped out. Yeah, and there were just low wall remnants, but and we're plastered against that, trying to avoid the, all this crap come excuse me coming down on us there. And then I made the mistake of trying to get up and run to a, another hole, and that's when I was hit. You were hitting Belvedere? Yep, right on top of Belvedere. And how, when you were hitting Belvedere, how did they get you down off the Well, when they, uh, late they, uh, uh, I remember Danny Fantoni was the uh, K Company aid man who came over and patched me up. Boy, you can't say enough for eight men. I'll tell you, those were guys who were incredible because everybody was lying flat and they were moving around, uh, patching people up. And he came up and he cut a big rip in my new combat pants. And uh, I thought it was going to freeze my leg. It was a cold night. So, uh, so I, after I, when I was hit, I just a couple of steps and I flopped into a hole. And lo and behold, there was a German soldier in there. And he was a kid, uh, I can't have been 18 years old. I can still see his great wide eyes. He was scared stiffless. He wasn't wearing a helmet. And he and I looked at each other. It seemed like a long time, but it, probably just a second or two. And I wasn't about to shoot him, and apparently he wasn't about to shoot me. And they, he just hopped up and ran back mm. and disappeared. And so I stayed in that hole for until that mortar barrage quit, and then and it got to be pretty daylight, and then I started sliding back down the hill on my rear end, keeping my foot up ahead of me. And I was sliding down, and the first thing I heard was some guy off my right, down, hey, Lieutenant, stop, 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 stop. And I, I look over there, and the guy said, mines. And I looked down the hill. I was about to slide right into some of these the wires of these post mines. So they came over. One of them was, uh, was Roger Newhall. I don't remember who the second guy was. And they helped me limp back down to the aid station. And they went back up and did their job. So how long were you out of commission? I was out. I was in the hospital in Pistoia. It was 70th General Hospital, which was a wonderful... Could you say that again? 70th General Seven. Hospital. Do you, you need some refreshments, Chuck? I'm fine. <laughs> and uh, 
the 70th general was a wonderful it, the entire St. Louis University medical school have been formed into a general hospital the dean of the school was the colonel in command all of the surgeons were captains and they were uh, professors of surgery and the nurse I remember the nurse that opened up when I opened up my eyes when I finally it took quite a long time to get back to Pistoia to the hospital I, from, they probably moved me off the mountain about 10 o'clock in the morning or something like that by the time I went through the regimental aid station the division and then they on back to Pistoia I didn't get back to the hospital there at probably midnight. Hmm. And you were wounded all the time? Yeah. And did it, did, did, I think I've always wondered if you're wounded. Does it ever get to the point where it doesn't hurt anymore? I don't remember it hurting. You don't remember it hurting? Huh. Uh, it did. I couldn't move my leg, but uh, no, I don't remember it hurting. And, and uh, I know that they given me a shot of morphine, so that. Did, did, was it the morphine or just that it did not hurt? I don't know. It didn't. It didn't. It was just like I'd been kicked in the leg. That's all I know. And, and it didn't. Do uh, you still have problems on Wednesday? Uh. Really. Oh, yeah. So you get to the hospital, and how long were you at the hospital? I was there for a month. A month. So then that means that they send you back to the tenth. On about the fifteenth of March. Fifteenth of March. And see, this is this right. This thing here, uh, I was still gone from the company. But where was where was your pioneers? Well, who took over for you while you were gone? Jack Walker. Oh, so there was no lieutenant. Mm -hmm. No. So you pick them up. My God, they kept my job for me. <laughs> so you pick them up the 15th of March. Where are they? They are at uh, uh, behind Dallas Bay. Dallas Bay. And, and so what's I, going on there? I was mad as hot because about. Uh, a week or maybe a little less before I was discharged from the hospital. Oh, about three or four, maybe five guys from the platoon. And that was really neat. They had gotten leave to Pistoia and they came into the hospital to visit me. And I'm sure Bob was one of them. But they had sad news that Jack Mautner had been killed. And that's it. When I heard about it and learned about it, Totally, totally uh, unnecessary. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I want to talk about the you idiot, want, idiot. Why don't you talk about it? Because we might be able to find his descendants, and they may be able to have his tape. Maybe I don't want to talk about it. Well, then maybe, you know. Oh, you mean Walker? Yeah, let's talk. Can you talk about his death? No, because I wasn't there. But I can tell you from what the guys tell me. Why don't you talk about that? But I, you know, because... The assistant division command, uh, assistant battalion commander, who in my view was totally incompetent, he had sent Mautner and a crew of six or eight men on the forward slope of Dallas Bay in the middle of the afternoon on a clear day to reconnoiter a road and perhaps if it, if it needed repair shell holes or something for, so that uh, traffic, the trucks and whatnot could get on that road to repair it. The stupidest thing that ever happened. They, he, would, he, would, he would send these men out right where the Germans had a broad view of them. And the Germans let him let them get out there in this open, on that road, and they lowered the boom. Were they all killed? No, they weren't killed, but Mautner was killed. And at least four of the men were seriously wounded. These were all pioneers. They're all pioneers, yeah. Do you want to say who the assistant battalion commander's name was? You bet I do. Who was it? It was Eric Wickner. Wickner. How do you spell that? W I C K N E R. And what did the guys think of him? They thought the same thing and I do, that the, the, that the guy was an idiot. Was there any reason why he gave for doing that? Oh, I have no idea. No, he, you never spoke to him about it. Well, uh, the last time I, I, he uh, he took over the battalion when when uh, Sheeler was was uh, wounded when we were crossing the pole, but I really had ever, never had anything to do with him.
Did you ever talk to Schiller about it? No, he wouldn't no. talk about that. He wouldn't talk about it. Okay. Isn't that kind of thing that they discussed? But uh, all of this, here's Wickner stayed in the, he, he started with the 87th at Fort Lewis and got up to be a major somehow or another. And then he stayed in the Army in another 20 years or so. Hmm. And he retired as a major. Well, that's interesting, because usually I retire as a major. Well, anyway, so you get back to Dallas Bay, you get back to your men. Yeah, I got back and to, and they're cooking French fries. They're cooking French fries? <laughs> but who was taking the place of uh, 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 Sergeant? Jesse Spencer. Jesse Spencer. Yeah, he'd been a, a sergeant uh, head there. He wouldn't have been my choice, but uh, at that time, I, he had been appointed. So, uh, well, so this was like 15th of March, and the 15th of March, what? Because you're getting ready to go into another battle. Well, yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't do a heck of a lot. Uh, we built a forward OP because the uh, colonel and even the general on the forward slope of Dallas Bay, rest assured, we did it at night. Uh, but we fortified a house, used our explosive to draw, knock down a big, a big, uh, big what kind of tree was that? A sycamore or something like that, about as big as this tabletop with a huge charge of explosive this up on this side of the tree and was down on this side when it went off it just sheared it off. But why would you have done that? Did you need to go through there? Well it was blocking our view. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it made an awful noise in the middle of the night. Uh, that's when Jack Rivard dang near killed me because uh, he'd been one of those guys we, we when we were doing this work on this house filling it full of sandbags. Uh, well, we always put outposts out to warn us of any incoming traffic. And uh, Jack Rivard, I went out to check him. I came around the haystack and Jack Rivard was just about to have his grenade in his hand and just about to lob it at me. And he said, oh, excuse me, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. Okay, so then from this point on, was the next big thing up there in Castle Diana, up there on the 12th and the 11th, is that the next push that you were involved in? On the 14th of April. 14th of April. Well, because well, it was supposed to start the 12th, wasn't it? But the weather was bad. Yeah, the happen. airplanes couldn't come in and do their And then they, then Roosevelt also died. Yep, that's right. And they, because there wasn't there some discussion that it was really because of the weather, but they said it was Roosevelt. Was that? Well, uh, the weather, when we pushed off, the weather was beautiful. And uh, then uh, there again on that day, we had the same position, the two uh, the forward companies. And, we're in the, and this would have been the 15th you're talking this about. This is on the 14th of April. Yes, okay, 14th. Yeah. Because I think your original orders were to push off on the 12th. Could be. But it was pouring rain and miserable. Well, I don't remember that. I that, just read that someplace. Yeah, place. yeah. But uh, yeah, it was in April and it probably had been because that was mm -hmm. soggy so weather. Was, the 14th that you pushed off. Yep. And what was your objective? And what was the objective of the pioneer? Well, I don't know. It's the same dang deal. We no, we were to stay, and in this case, we, well, the setup was the same. We had the same. So should we stop the interview so we can get? You want to get through? We're doing an interview. Yeah. Good. Well, we come through here. Yeah, well, let's go. Oh, sure. Why don't you? Yeah, I think we have to catch the transport oh. up to it because it's some place that you can't hey, get to. I've got a car, and if need be, I can get you. Up. Okay, because it's evidently... It's downtown. Oh, I thought you said there was no parking or something. No, well, it's downtown. And it right, it's dip parking is difficult. But, and, but let's let's say during dessert. Okay. Are you big on dessert? My what? Are you a big dessert person? <laughs> Can we, when they start, you know, once it's decided that this A&P platoon had to be created or organized, well, because they changed the they changed the division table of organization from a light division to a standard division, and the standard division had uh, a pioneer platoon in the Italian headquarters company. We didn't have that in the light I division. Didn't have, you know what? That's going to have to be exposed. Oh, you have it on. Oh yeah. Yeah. See, that's very interesting. Yeah. And the other thing that I wanted to ask was. When you you had those pack boards, were there any times that you carried like big crates up on your shoulders? Did they ever do? You mean without a pack board? Yeah. 
No. No. Not that I can recall. No, because, they, because that's that's sometimes that's the way that uh, artillerymen, they, particularly if they had a stack over here and they're going to bring it over the gun, mm -hmm. they'd pick up a couple of rounds and pack them that way. But we were following these troops all the time, and and then also during the an assault, then our guys might have to go back and load up again and bring them up to the to the rifle. And the pack boards were the way to carry the biggest load. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if that was the only way of carrying it. Well, it's probably it, the safest and and the best for your back as well. Yeah, but we couldn't. On now, once we got in the flat ground, well, then we didn't have to do that. We just had to load it up on a jeep, take it up. Well, when you were saying about that advanced ammo depot, you, was it just that one spot, or did you go up that mountain and leave that various spots? No, no. Ammo, just one? One spot. One central. Right in the middle of it. This was our area that we were to go up and have one company over here, one company over here, and then the, the, the reserve company would be following up in the middle. We'd put it as close to the middle as we could get it. And if the idea was to have it all up there as close as possible, so that when we needed it, it wasn't too far behind us. Well, you guys were fortunate that those Germans never found them. Oh, my goodness. I'll you. you bet. Well, they so, And so then this platoon just operated as its own entity. It was never really divvied out to anybody else or <clears throat> joined up with anybody else except with what you said at times. Maybe they needed support. Maybe yeah, you well, sent a that, couple guys. Yeah, we were, we were to, to, our main job in combat was, was mines, besides ammo, ammo supply. And then you got involved in the fighting then as well. I should hope to tell you. <laughs> Pretty brutal. Yeah. Absolutely. Interesting. I find it so, it's just very interesting. Hmm. Well. Well, we ready to yeah, break now? Yeah, why don't we break because uh, we probably need okay. to... We ended right at the end of the session, and I'm not sure I fully... I don't know if it was... Expo I don't understand when you were saying about everybody else moved off and and the pioneers had to stay. No. Oh, okay. <coughs> Maybe you should... Would you start there? So no, I, I, I I think, why don't you start with 913? Yes, because no. I, I kind of... I, I think, think a lot of people are confused by 913. Really? Well, yeah, a lot yes. of people, Hill 913, they're not sure what it was, and so, are, are you, are we on? Yeah, go okay. for it. Okay, because I think that nine hill, hill thir 913, they took various hills. The 3rd Battalion took Hill 913. Yeah, that was our uh, objective, that's correct. You know what, maybe I should move so that he's not, I'll move over to that corner, so I'm out of so camp. Want your chair over here? here? No, I'll just sit on this one. There you go. Um, and so why don't you tell us, 913, start, was they jumped off on the 14th. So why don't you tell us who the key players were, where the pioneers were? Yeah, well, uh, let me think. Um, first of all, on the, on the morning of, of 9, of uh, the 14th of April, <coughs> it was unlike Belvedere, it was a daylight attack. Our, uh, we were supposed to cross the line of departure front companies at 9.45. Well, starting about, I don't remember the times exactly, but starting about, uh, well, I would say 8 o'clock, the uh, Air Force airplanes came in. B-40, or no, P-47s, and uh, I guess I just remember P-47s. And they plastered this row of hills across from, to the north of, of Dallas Bay with, uh, Napalm, you know, this, they, they dropped this bomb and this huge cloud of fire and, and smoke would come up. And then another plane would come in and they'd bomb and they'd rocket. And pretty soon that whole hillside over there was nothing but a mass of dust. And this, this went on for maybe 30 minutes. And then the airplanes disappeared and then our own artillery started up. And they plastered those hills over there. And we were some of us were looking at this and OPs and whatnot. Couldn't figure out how anybody could survive that, how they could live in what had just happened over there. And this, so this, then that, the artillery quit about nine o'clock or something like that. And then our guys 
pushed off of the hill. Now we came off of the west side of, uh, of Delos Bay. This was the 3rd Battalion. And there was a, it's called Pra del Bianco Basin. Mm -hmm. Like this. That's right, and it's just a, it's just a valley between Delos Bay and and, 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 this, and steep and this down this little creek, mm -hmm. and then back up across open uh, cultivated fields, across a little road up there between Prada LBM and, the, and around the corner, and on up to 913 the hill. And you know this hill is when you look out there now it's pretty unimpressive. It's, is that right? Oh yeah, it's. Uh, it's just, it's just like a walk in the park, really, mm -hmm. as far as down into that rather steep valley and then back up across these fields. Except that this, this road that went around below, uh, there was a little little uh, group of houses called uh, Famatisia. And uh, later on, that was our battalion aid station. But we passed that and went on this road. And it was really quite quiet. I, I, once again, the pioneers were following between the two lead companies. And do you remember who they were? Who? The lead companies. Did we say it was L and something? I, I know it was L, and I, I thought it was I, L, and, L and K. Well, which one was uh, Dolan? Dolan was with I. So, because that's where he got hit. Yeah, he got hit down just after he crossed the bottom and just barely started up the valley. So maybe, maybe I company was at least there. Oh, yeah, oh, yes, indeed they were. Uh, maybe it was I and L with K in reserve again. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. And maybe that figured because they, they, they rather quickly committed K company. So mm -hmm. it turned out to be a whole, all three companies were committed. But uh, once you get across this little steep little gully and then start up across these open fields, that's where it became a killing field because they had wonderfully established cross uh, machine gun machine machine gun crossfire and that, that shelling and airplane attack and all that didn't seem to affect it one bit. They got down on they were down in the holes and when this all quit they just popped up and there they there they are waiting for us again. And so getting out of there and up up, up across that valley was a uh, I say it was just just to slaughter, and, um, and so L and I and well they were there all because my old uh, in K Company my old uh, platoon sergeant uh, Mac McCarthy was killed there just on the slope of 913. So I know the K Company was was involved in, in that, but. Um, it just took forever for them, for the companies to push across and get up that that valley, so that uh, we were the pioneers were in a column coming past by Mount to Famatisia. We got down on that road probably about uh, oh, I guess maybe 10:30 to 11 o'clock, and we were supposed to take go right straight ahead up that hill and pack up more ammo and bring it up between the attacking companies up on the 913 and 8 something or other. And uh, we, in order to try and stay out of, out of the line of fire as much as possible from, on the left there was Mont Belgaro, mm -hmm. which was, as far as we knew, nobody was working on it. And the, the artillery and the uh, 4.2 mortars were trying to smoke that to keep the observation from our left flank. So we were kind of going around 913, this one, this is the Pioneers, and we were going to, because our, our um, approach with our uh, ammo and where we wanted to, to have the uh, mules who were right behind us, our, our company of mules, wanted them to dump in that, that little draw, which sort of went up in the middle around the corner and up to 913. Well, we got up across this field finally, just going like hell. Yeah. I ask you, you it was machine gun fire. Was it um, mortars as well? That was. Oh there? yeah, there, there a lot of you know a lot of small arm uh, machine gun, machine pistol, uh, rifle fire. So you took mines there too. My guys had already opened tracks. Through. So there was already. So when we when the rest of us came came along behind, 
we were able to see that and see the tape and we could just zip right up through that. Mm -hmm. And then we got up, but we got up in this little draw. And in the meantime, the, the second battalion, who was take, supposed to take the hill, there was a little, kind of a basin back there. 913 the basin and then this hill over here. And the second battalion was supposed to capture that hill. Well, that's, that's our friend uh, Stone Battalion. Mm -hmm. and he was hiding somewhere in a hole somewhere and then they just got hung up down there uh, on the road. And they, didn't, they didn't come up and do their job. So our left flank and our right flank was all exposed. And so when, when <laughs> Anyhow, we got up in this little draw, and obviously a, a art, a artillery observer who was still up here on this hill up here just zeroed in on us, and it was a three-gun gun battery, and I think they were, because later on I looked at one of the shell holes where a dead hit, and I think it was a 105 battalion, I mean a battery, because they'd fire three rounds, and, it, and so we dived into these holes that the Germans had dug previously. And the shells just started coming in. It was just zip, 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 zip. And there'd be a 10 second interval. And then here'd come three more. And this went on for most of an hour. We couldn't stick our heads up. I, in fact, I was concerned there was a, and I was in the hole with John Stokes. And uh, Johnny got kind of nervous, but I don't blame him. There was a tree stubble tree sticking up and I was scared to death that that thing shell hit the tree we get an air burst and kill us in the hole but anyhow so we stayed in there uh, almost an hour one that mentioned John Stokes is that in the time of this it, the shells were hitting so close apparently there was enough of relief that they couldn't depress to quite quite hit us mm. and the shells were coming I could they, they just flash over that hole and it, and they would burst all the closest from here to that pile. And whenever these things would explode, they just lift you up off the ground. And, and, uh, Did that? You're, you're up here. Dad was there too. Hmm? Did that affect your hearing? Was that a big part of it? Yeah. 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 I had I had already some pretty serious damage. This was back in when we were waiting to get in OCS, and I was supposed to. All of us were supposed to fall in. Mm -hmm. uh, we were all, that's another story. We were we were OCS students and prior, is this all right? Talk about sure, that. yeah, no, this is, this is what we want. <laughs> prior to uh, 1943, all OCS graduates, whenever they graduate, they're automatically commissioned. Mm -hmm. Well, the Army at this time had found out that what we were being taught in OCS was World War I tactics, trench warfare, and known about uh, Avatar, these these crazy things that they used in World War II. It, it didn't affect World War, I mean World War I. It didn't affect, have anything to do with World War II. And so how, what the Army was doing to try and, and, and uh, correct that situation was bring these new le lieutenants previous to Fort Benning for what they called uh, uh, basic officer training. And they gave them all the new stuff that uh, they needed in World War II. Well, of course, if you have, if you have a bunch of officers in there and you got some other officers instructing them, you really can't lean on them very hard. So they, when we graduated in '43, and this was all all over the country, there, they graduated us as enlisted men, and we sat in, in, this, in my case in my in the University of Nebraska, we sat down in Fort Riley, Kansas, in in tents out there in the middle of the Kansas heat, it was miserable. But uh, there were guys from Minnesota and, and uh, Iowa, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, all these uh, land-grant universities that had ROTCs. And so we went to the, well, I, while we were waiting, at least in my case, we were waiting with a bunch of us in, in Kansas at Fort Riley. And we weren't assigned anything particularly, we were just waiting. And so they like, put us to work in KP and they put us to work cleaning the, the police and the grounds and, and or uh, the marching all morning or, you know, just make work stuff. But they never knew where you were. And so when I, we would come out, I soon learned that if I was, that's where you're supposed to go, but I never 
and I'd go out to the rifle room. And I'd lie out there and I'd shoot. I just stayed at the end of the and then I, and then I did that all day for weeks. I'm quite sure that was the start of all. And 13 didn't. Glacious shelling. And mm -hmm. uh, then on 9 13, right over our head. And he's yanking down and left close. Do you remember where Jill? start to slow down because this is the main approach for all the activity so they slowed down enough and pretty soon we were counting and there was 10 okay let's see where was I uh, okay there we waited and we were counting and a bunch of us here now I, at this point Jesse Spencer was the, the uh, platoon sergeant he was there. And so this is, this is Sarge, uh, let's send two guys back at a time when we get a gap on the next round. So we waited, here they came, wham, wham, wham. And we pointed two guys, for God knows who they were, jump, run. And so they went ripping out, hopped up and ran to get away before the next three rounds come in. Came in. And then uh, that went on until we had everybody out two at a time. And so the last ones out were Jess Spencer and me. And when we got around, the, here they came, hit, 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 go. So we jumped and ran. And we were running right back where we had come up trying to get out. And I hadn't gone 20 yards. And I had longer legs and I could run faster than Jess. And I looked back because he, the round had come in kind of quick. And I looked back, and he was coming out of the smoke of that thing, that black smoke, head down, running as hard as he could. And right past him at that moment, right past his left hip, came a, one of a jagged fragment from that shell, which was about 18. Because when those shells burst, they they, they just shred the steel just tears and the that's the terrible thing about shell fire that the, the steel shreds into knife razor sharp fragments and so I could see this this slab of that shell coming out of that smoke right past his hip and it was about the, about that long and maybe two inches wide and it was coming like a boomerang and I saw death coming at me because that thing came right past his hip and was in right for me. I looked over my shoulder. And I could still see that that boomerang coming at me, looking over my shoulder and running as hard as I could. And that sucker went past my left hip, I swear. It just, uh, as it s s was swinging, it just went around my hip. It had cut me in two if, I, if it had hit me. What went what, through your mind? Uh, well, I don't know what went through my, I just was so, I, yeah, I thought I was, I, I was fascinated by that, watching it, it seemed like a slow motion, that thing coming at me, and nothing went through my mind, I just, I, God, I guess I'm going to get hit again, but it just went around my, went right past my left hip, and went on down the hill, and bounced in the dirt, and kicked up, with, and we just was kept there, running. Was there any reflection later that, you know, re delayed reaction, like, you know, I've been spared, or? Or were you just too young at that time to reflect on it? Well, I just, no, I don't know. I just, uh... You were, what, 22? I was 23. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I that's don't know. That's when you're I, invincible. I get, oh, heck, yes. You know, that's the one thing about, and, and all these 
people you'd line up and they're going to make one on attack and something like that. But you're never going to get hit. It's the guy over here or the one over here. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get hit. And so when that thing went by, it's just, oh, my God, that kind of missed me. But uh, anyhow, we went down the hill and across that little gully, and got up on the road, which was, and there's a little bridge there, and we figured, well, we'll get all of us who had been in that thing, we'll get around that bridge, and if they start shelling this road here, we'll get under the bridge. But uh, we hadn't been there maybe 10 minutes or maybe like that. And coming down the road, as hat, dumb and happy as anybody, is a Red Cross girl in her Jeep driving down this damn road, and she starts handing out donuts to her. <laughs> <laughs> and we couldn't believe it, but we said, get the hell out of here. They're shelling the even daylights out of here. You, why are you here? Well, I came to bring donuts. So we each took a couple of handfuls of donuts and said, go. And Thank back you. she went to Castle de Hano. <laughs> oh, it was, that's the only time that I, these girls did hang hand out donuts, but never walking right into the, right in the middle of the battle like that. Well, I was, we were all uh, very much opposed to women around there in the Army anyhow. So did you take time out to eat your donuts, or did you just... You bet your life. <laughs> Enjoy the donuts. Well, then just while we were eating our donuts, George Dorrington came, comes trotting down the road, blood running off his head and his shoulder and whatnot. And he said, hop and get up there and see if you can't take a cannon in can uh, England, that he's been hit. So back up, we have to go up that same place where we had just come from. And, Ken England was the company commander, a wonderful man, mm -hmm. each of a fellow, uh, M Company, a headquarters company. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we'll look up there, and Ken is lying just in, in the edge of this damn minefield, flat on his back. Uh, his face was just one mass of blood in his, his front. And his radio operator, was lying on this cobblestone road that uh, they had been. What? And Ken and his radio operator, and I don't know who the other fellow was wounded to. But anyhow, um, Ken couldn't, he, he was just down flat, but nothing I could do to him at the moment. But I walked up the road, and, and this time I remember Bob, and he wanted to come. I said, Oh, don't you know you stay put? Because I'm going to go walk down that road and see what well, this guy that's flopping around. And this was the radio operator, and, and he had stepped on an S mine. And that had blown up, right, and, and blown off his left arm so that he just had about a stub of half of his arm left, black stub. And incredibly, it wasn't bleeding very much. Now, you asked me before, you know, when he got hit, did it hurt? Well, uh, why in the world that man didn't bleed to death instantly, have his arm lost? Because it burned it. Just, just seared it, I guess. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's probably the most time. You know, I was probably more scared at that moment than I was ever any other time because I was sure he was flopping like a chicken that's had his head cut off, screaming, and I was sure he was going to set off another mine right there with me by him. Mm -hmm. And so I was either he shut up or I want to hit him or kill him, make him lie still. But I finally just stayed on top of him and then had some of the other guys come up on that same walk on those rocks because the cobbles they didn't put the, they put the mines over in the ditch off the side of this cobblestone uh, because the ground was softer and also if you if uh, somebody shot at you you got into the ditch so that's where they, they put, put, the, put the mines but anyhow so this guy we, we uh, some of my guys uh, held him down and another guy went to, the, went to look for a uh, Eight man to pack him out. And I went through the minefield and got up to Ken, and he was still alive, so we eased him back out and got him on a stretcher and took him back to the aid station, but both of them died the next day. So he, Ken, died at the aid station? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know where he died that day, no. I think he lasted a day. A day? Yeah. But his, uh, radio operator, he, he 
I didn't know who it was until, by golly, I saw in the, in the blizzard uh, some fellow talking about he was hit in the same time uh, Ken England was, so I talked call, and talked to him. And then he told me the name of this radio operator, and it's something like uh, Angelo Berdini or something like that. He's on the on the list of the dead ones. Yeah. On the monument? Yep. And then after, after so 9.13, and then, then that night, uh, was, we didn't have to stay on the hill. We went back to our barn back by the battalion headquarters the night before. And so they pulled you back after that battle? Yeah. And when you went back, did they feed you and clothe you and, I mean, give you showers? Clothe you? you I mean, shower. You. <laughs> I mean, because I know they gave you showers and gave you all new clothing at one point. No, no. No? We didn't. You mean after that? Well, I knew at one point they said they took, well, they took, they took the soldiers back for R&R. &R, yes. Gave you all, I thought it was right after Hill 913. No, no, because no. after we pushed off 913, we didn't stop moving. We never had a bath until we were up on Lake Garda. You didn't have an R&R &R after 913? Oh, no, no, I was go, go, go. We never stopped after 913. Because L Company was pulled back on the 15th to R&R. &R. L Company was? Mm -hmm. They were pulled back and then they jumped off again. L Company was pulled back. Well, our, our but office... But you, you, you guys didn't get pulled back? And they supposedly got showers and all nope. new clothing and food? Nope, we wore the same clothes from, uh, oh, cripes, uh, well, let's see, we were pushed off on the 14th, therefore we hadn't, we hadn't had a, at that point, uh, these pioneers, we hadn't had a clean shirt for, for almost a week at that time, and we were still wearing the same clothes when we got to Garda. What, how did you eat? How did that, what? How did they feed you, or how did you eat? You're, you're young men in your 20s, you must be starving. Well, yeah, when we got back, after the first day of 913 up on the hill, and we went back to our place, they, they uh, headquarters company had a kitchen set up back at this. They didn't move the kitchen. <laughs> and then uh, that night, I took a, about uh, 40 uh, replacements up to the companies, mm -hmm. dropped them off and, uh, mm -hmm. to f fill up some of the spot of the people who had been killed. Now that's an awful thing to have happen. I, I don't know about me. I'm talking about those young fellows who were replacement. To be in that position, they knew nobody. They didn't know the people they were with. They were taken up in the dark and shell fire all around them, dumped off on somebody, and, and said. And they knew this. nobody. They knew nobody. They didn't last very long either. And actually. a lot of them didn't last till morning. Mm -hmm. The first sergeant even didn't even get to know their name. There there's two listed like that. I don't know if you're aware of that. If there's two men that are listed that they came up and they were killed before they got their names. Yeah. My dad said that too. Didn't even know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I have no clue. Yeah. It, it, they were gone. It was tough coming in as a replacement. It was even tougher coming oh. in as an officer replacement. Yes, I'm bad too. I'm bad. Mm -hmm. I, I think that made. Well, anyway, well, so Bob Dole's one of those, you know. He didn't. He only, he only lasted six weeks. Well, my father actually came in as a replacement. I know he did. Anyways. Four days. So then you went back and they um, fed you. And then what did you do after that? Well, we spent two or three days. It, there, it's really foggy, but for those two or three days, we stayed cleaning up the battlefield, hauling okay. bodies out getting them out of the minefields, mm -hmm. getting them back to Charlie Mincer in the, mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, Graves registration tent. He had bodies stacked up like cordwood mm -hmm. uh -huh. in this tent. Uh, and we you know, stick them in a mattress cover and mm -hmm. and put one of their dog, you leave one dog tag on on the body and the other dog tag you tie to his toe. Mm -hmm. And uh, in their mouth, did they? No, most of them they had on the outside of the bag. In the, and then they, they trucked them someplace. They trucked them back to uh, near uh, graves. Florence. Yeah, for graves. Yes. Yeah. And they put them in temporary graves. Mm -hmm. And then after the war, then they dug mm -hmm. them up and put them in nice orderly mm -hmm. fashion. Yeah. So then you cleaned up the, the battlefield. And by that time, the regiment had all had moved off to the east. So they went down by Toll? Tolly. Is it Tolly? Tolly. Tolly. They went through Tolly and yeah. down and through Highway 9. Right. 
that came out of the mountains of Highway 9. Yeah. So you weren't involved in that? Because nope. I think 3rd Battalion was one of the first ones to jump off. Mm -hmm. K and L went down. That's what I read, yeah. And then they were actually the the left flank of the 85th. L, L Company was the left flank. And then right after that, the 86th followed in, mm -hmm. into the valley. Well, we had a devil of a time catching up when we got the orders to leave 913 and catch up. How did you catch up? Well, we just uh, they had a truck for us, and we just loaded the whole platoon in, in at 6 by and took off and stayed with the... The roads were just jam-packed with traffic. Uh, everything, they were, everything was on the move. Mm -hmm. Artillery guns, uh, uh, infantrymen, uh, trucks and, and vehicles of any, every mm -hmm. time on these little bitty narrow roads mm -hmm. and it, the dust was just choking mm -hmm. and the whole army was on the move mm -hmm. and totally but it was a bad place because when we went through that we got shelled heavily there mm -hmm. because the road was on the on our side until you get to Tolly and then you went over the ridge and you're on the side where the Germans could see it and they'd shell the hell out of Tolly and, and then you drop back and then the road came back over and you were mm -hmm. safe again. Mm -hmm. So totally was sort of a, an aiming point for him for quite a while. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, we it took us uh, probably a day and a half to catch up. So, did it, so when you caught up with them, were they at the Pope? No, no. When we caught up with them, they were just about Highway 9. Oh, okay. Do you remember? The, you don't remember the date, do you? The what? The date. Cause the, because the 3rd Battalion actually went across Highway 9. They, they crossed over Highway 9 on the 20th of April. And that's when they broke into the Pope. Yeah. Well, that that's figures because that would be uh, nine days after we mm -hmm. hit mm -hmm. Dallas. I mean, nine thirteen. Because we spent, uh, like I said, three days or better there, cleaning up dead, and then or three days catching, a couple of days at least catching up. It's it's very confused mm -hmm. <laughs> at that time. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, after. Uh, when we, we, were, we didn't catch up with them by golly until they had crossed the highway. Mm -hmm. But then between the highway and Bon Porto mm -hmm. is when we caught up. And we were in the in the column, the, the, the bridge across the Adige, I think it mm -hmm. is there. And that unfortunately had not been blown. But and when we crossed there in, in our column battalion, there was an 88 sitting down the highway looking at the cross, looking at the bridge. And I guess it was all by itself, but though that sucker was firing time fire over this, over this bridge, over the bomb porto, in mm -hmm. the end bomb porto. And so I have vivid memories of all the trucks lined up behind the buildings. The road over the bridge, the river was here, the road went across it this way, but there was a street on this side in the, in the town. And we were all lined up on the buildings, all the vehicles. And I was in a jeep, and the, and the, the platoon was in the truck ahead of me. And we just kind of inched up because they would wait for those idiots to fire on the bridge. Mm -hmm. And then one truck would rush out and roar across the bridge and then make a sharp right turn to get out of the line of fire again. And, and uh, it was just like going, running up. Uh, what do they call it? A gamut. Not a gamut, but a run the gauntlet. The gauntlet, exactly. And, but you, you tried to time it so that the truck zipped across before they could reload. Did and they could get, reload in 88 awful fast. Did anybody get caught? They did. I'm, I'm trying to, one of the companies, uh, they got a round ride over them and they killed three or four men in the truck. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we just got across, go like hell and turn off. And uh, we, we, none of us were hurt. So where did you go after you crossed? Well, then you went to the Po. Yeah, and then we were then. But we, they'd already crossed the Po. Then they made it. There. No, 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 no. Then we became part of Task Force Duff. Duff. Mm -hmm. And we, that was our battalion. And so we were on the lead and we it, the boomed across. Third battalion was on the lead. Mm-hmm. Mm. And uh, all I can remember particularly of that is that every little tiny town we went through, while we got white flags and, and, mm -hmm. and we were leaving a, a town every 10 minutes and they uh, and once again the truck was ahead of me 
and uh, and uh, of course we were getting all kinds of bread and, and wine that we handed into. We went across the Po Half Con, I mean across the Po <laughs> Valley, and everybody. But uh, also at this time it was the German army was in complete disarray, and the 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 uh, surrendering Germans just they finally overwhelmed uh, the, 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 uh, they call them the military police and then they'd come out and then just wave them back and so there was a long line of German prisoners walking to the rear while we were driving down the road but we had to stop every once in a while because uh, we some German trucks would be coming across and they were on a, on a point like this so everybody would bail out and shoot at those trucks and and then finally get caught and burn up or disappear and the Germans would bail out and get in the ditch. And then we just, just go ahead and leave those guys in and they were happy to. We had a couple of tanks with us and they, once we were going along on a road a mile away was another column of Germans. They were just paralleling us. So the tanks just swung on, picked them off just like, like uh, gophers. <laughs> you know, they, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a madhouse going across there. And at one point, we were stopped briefly in a, in a little town just before we yeah, got to... I'm going to have to get out. Just move out for a second. You guys continue. We were stopped briefly in a little town uh, waiting for some, uh, some, somebody to run into a roadblock or something ahead of us. And around the corner comes a German soldier running full tilt. And he runs up to the back of the truck with a platoon in it. He stops, he throws his pack up in the truck, throws his rifle up in the truck, crawls up, and realizes he's in the wrong truck. Is this your platoon? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. kidding. And so, uh, then, and then we took off again. And there was nothing to do but to wait. And the guy just sat down and I flipped through his rifle away. And so, the guys in there, my platoon looked at him and he looked at them. And he looked out the back and hired you. And the next stop, they dumped him out and said, down the road. But, but he was, he uh, could not be more supply, surprised. Like he got in that dang truck and looked around. Oh, he threw his rifle away and sat down. <laughs> but, and uh, so then we, uh, we really didn't have any serious opposition. Uh, we had we were strafed at uh, about just about sundown and by a German plane that zipped over us a couple of times and uh, I don't recall anybody getting hurt. We bailed out into the ditches. Everybody shot at him. And then when we got to the Po, uh, everybody was so tired that we we just passed out. And this was late in the afternoon, so we slept in a in a barn house somewhere out there on the edge of the Po River behind a levee and they shelled us all night long and then the next morning uh, they sat around until about a little after noon and then they said it's your turn we're going to cross the river. Over the dike we went and got into some uh, eight-man wooden boats and we were two those engineers. Ducks? The, were those ducks? Had, no, not ducks. These were no. for, for rope. You're kidding. No, no, we went. We, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. They, because they're leaving, and I have to get us going. I'll be back. You bet. No, we rode across the pole. You're kidding. That's what my dad said. But they didn't. My dad said they went at night. What group? What, what? He was in the um, 85th G Company, and they rode across at night. Oh, really? Well, that, I could understand that because we didn't get across until mid-afternoon. Yeah. I, in fact, I think he said they were one of the first groups to go across. Yeah. Well, the first to go across was, it was the 87th. Yeah. They got it but across in the morning, and then we crossed uh, in the afternoon, uh, the 3rd Battalion, and uh, then the, uh, your yeah. battalion, they came across. And even, but, it, it, you know, it's quite a thing. That that river is uh, about as big as the Missouri. and. Uh, they had, they had some 88s upriver that were shooting at me. There again, those damned airbursts. Unfortunately, we, we didn't get any. I don't think we lost a man in the 80s in our battalion. Uh, some other groups, like the 87th, I think they caught 
they got underneath some of that dang flak, and they got some of those guys got hurt. Uh, oh, that's it. Uh, a friend, a guy that I know well now, he was in, he was a, in the uh, weapons platoon of K Company, and he dang near lost an eye from a shell fragment there on the pole. But um, so you actually went over what, like in a rowboat? Yeah. Is you that what you guys went over? You bet. Okay. Oh, I did not know that. Yep, we did indeed. And uh, they were, they were, where, where did you get the boats? Well, the engineer battalion got them someplace. We weren't. They thought the 85th. Uh, division on our right would, would be there first, but they were way behind us. So we got to the pole first, and the idea was to get across, and our general, he, he just pushed the heck out of the thing. He said, get across any way you can. Well, they, the only thing they managed to bring up was some of these uh, assault boats, they call them. They're wooden eight or ten man boats. And, and two engineers, and I think maybe it's eight guys, or maybe ten in the boat. Get in there with your equipment. And eat. Everybody get a paddle, and you paddle like crazy. Mm -hmm. And it took 20 minutes to paddle across there. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you're paddling, but you're going downstream. So uh -huh. these Jeez. guys, the engineers, they had to paddle back across. And of course, they lost lost distance down this way. So they had to drag them up along the shore again to for the next bunch. I read somewhere that some of these engineers, after about three trips, they said, guys, you take them across, we're, we're pooped, we're not going <laughs> to. Is that right? But, uh, yeah, we, we went across with uh, paddle on our own canoe. Jeez. And, uh, and we set up a perimeter for that, uh, for that landing. And it was just march, 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 because uh, we had no, no uh, transportation at all. In fact, it was a big concern. We're, if we ran in any trouble, how are we going to get resupplied? And, you know, there were no bridges. And uh, so fortunately, the, the engineers were able to come up starting the next day, and within a day or two, they had, they had bridges across the boat. Okay, Floating bridges. Yes. But by that time, we were way down the road. Were you really? Yeah. Well, it got, after we crossed the pole, they set up an, uh, uh, a leapfrogging system. If one battalion would, would be marching, one battalion would be riding ahead in what trucks we had, and the other battalion was sleeping. And so it was, you, you get eight hours of rest, eight hours of marching, eight hours of driving. And we moved pretty fast at that rate. Yes, I guess but you But we did. also uh, got some long, dang marches. For instance? Oh, probably 25 miles. Is that right? And so anyhow... Did you meet opposition then? Very Did little. Very, very little. little? Yeah, it was just... You'd run into it and they, there might be a, 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 just a flurry of shooting or two or three shots or something and they'd send a platoon out to look at the barn that other shops came from and they'd flush out a couple of guys and bring them over the road, send them back down the road as prisoners. Right. Away we would go again. Mm -hmm. Most of them, in this case, our, our platoon, all we did was sit there and ride or wait. Mm -hmm. called, I was called up one time. A uh, tank hit a tank on our column, was uh, ran over a mine and blew a track, and it, and it uh, who the heck, I think it was our division general, uh, the, I think it was Ruffner. He was hit by a fragment from that from that uh, mine explosion. So they, I got called up to see if I, what the heck I could do in the way of mines. I couldn't find anything. Do was there, there any mines there? They'd already set them all off. Right. One thing I knew there was a Thompson submachine gun hanging on that on that uh, tank, and all I had at that point was a pistol. And so I swiped a Thompson. I had that the rest of the war. Did you really? Oh yeah, you, know, you can always find anything you buy anything you want lying around. Them. Oh, I'm that sure. Idea. I'm sure. But then, by that time, then, and shortly thereafter, we were marching up Lake Garda, and we got to. By this time, the 86th was, you know, their leapfrogging regiments, and we got up to Lake Garda and along the west east shore there, 
we just sat for a long time when the poor old 86 was up there battling the way through those uh, tunnels and had so many people hurt and those things. But right. we, we didn't get involved in that. So we were still sitting on the shore of Lake Garda when the, when the farm was just killed. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That's something. That was really the end of the war for us. Was it really? Oh, yeah. Well, there, then where did you go? Well, then they, uh, we sat there for a while and just sunned ourselves, and we were supposed to go back into into a training mode, which I guarantee you none of us were interested in at all. I'm sure. And so the colonel understand, understood when uh, we would go up, I'd take the platoon up on the, up on the side of the mountain for about a half an hour hike, and then we'd, we'd just lie there all day and read and write letters okay, home. Let's one. <laughs> I didn't bring you a beer, Joe. I'll get you one later. <laughs> so we just sit up there on the hill and read and write letters, the sun, tan. Is that right? And after it was time to go back down the hill in the afternoon, while well, that was our training, and we'd go sit down, goof off till dinner time. But <laughs> well, you certainly deserved it. And then from there we went to the division, got the notification that we were to be moved over near. area north of uh, what's the name of that town there at the north end of the uh, GMC uh, I can't remember either are we we're past now Lake Garda oh yeah okay we didn't have anything you know uh, was, well the only thing that that's significant that happened uh, there was that uh, Lake Garda the uh, uh, third battalion got the job of uh, crossing, we were getting shell fire from the road on the other, the, side, the west side of Lake Garda. There was a highway there. Have, have, have you been to the garden? Yeah, you go through here? the tunnels? No, yeah. the tunnels were up on the east side. That's where the 86 was fighting. Yeah, because they got badly hit up there. Yes. And, uh, but where was, the, where was 3rd Battalion? Uh, the 3rd Battalion was at Malchesney, which was about halfway up the lake. Yeah. And we were, we were, at that point, we were in reserve. If you're looking at a clock, where would it be on the clock? At three o'clock? Well, the, yeah. Three yeah. o'clock. Because the lake is north south. Yeah, so it's three o'clock. But across the lake is a is a is a road right on the on the lake shore. Mm -hmm. and the Germans were retreating up that road while we were advancing on the on the and, east side. And Mussolini was on that lake, wasn't he? Wasn't he like over around nine o'clock? He was. He was. He was at yeah at uh, Via. Villa. Why did I think the third battalion took his villa? You're right. Oh, they did. This okay. is one. Of them. Yeah, they. Yeah, I'm trying to name it. I just, I just found a. I'll tell the story about this. We went from the uh, Malchesney. The K Company was sent across the lake in mm -hmm. ducks mm -hmm. at night to set up roadblocks at Gardiano mm -hmm. and stop this German retreat up that up that road. And they got across safely. Nobody got hurt. Nobody got shot at anything. They landed, and they landed at uh, 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 Mussolini's villa, which he had occupied for some time. And Gene Hames is the mm -hmm. you know him. I know Foundation President. Okay, he he it was his platoon that occupied that villa. Gene slept in Mussolini's bed, mm -hmm. and he Gene he. Uh, relieved the general's material, I mean, the, the Mussolini's stuff in there. He has a couple of, of epaulettes of Mussolini's that have these three beautiful, solid gold pips on them. Mm. And uh, the guys, of course, they were getting all kinds of loot there. And we weren't supposed to take any loot. The upward come down from division, in fact, from corps, and said there was to be no looting. Well, the morning after, K Company occupied that and set up the roadblocks. Here comes a duck across the lake. We're from Corps with two colonels and a couple of enlisted guys and something. And they loaded that duck. Were they 10th Mountain colonels? No, no, no. These were from Corps. Oh, okay. What do you mean? Higher than division. So what do you mean when you say Corps? They weren't in the 10th Mountain? Yes, but they were. They were officers from 
you have corps, division, regiment, so okay. forth. These were higher up in, in the rear echelon. So like they would be in Hayes, in level with Hayes or no, above no, Hayes? Above Hayes. Above Hayes. And they came up with this duck and they loaded it up with tapestries off the wall, all kinds of silver stuff that they could pick up. They loaded that thing up and took it back to the guys back in the rear area. So that was enough. No looting, baloney. And these you know, guys picked up what they carried. But the trouble is that infantry generally on the move and they can't pack anything extra to speak of. We happened to be stuck there for a few days. And so everybody got a hold of something. I went over with Captain Brown and I wasn't going to get anything, but he, we were wandering around in the basement of Mussolini's villa. I just I got an article about just out of the latest Vogue magazine, that villa in the last three years has had something like $30 million. A guy bought it, and he's turned that into the fanciest hotel in Europe. It's a beautiful place. Start with an F. Via Villa starts with a D. I don't know. Anyhow, we were in the wandering around looking at the place, and it was pretty plush. I got downstairs, and there was one room that was full of nothing but big crates about as big as this desk. And the GIs had been in there and taken off the lid, and it was all beautifully had been beautifully packed china, and it was thin. Uh, I've never seen such beautiful uh, china ware, and it had gold rim around the top. And uh, I was like, man, there must be something in there. And then, because they had just crushed it, you know, like a bunch of eggshells. Mm -hmm. But I found five cups and six saucers. So I put them in a little bag and I took them. With. And then uh, Otto Brown, who wasn't liked at all. But he picked up a brass tray about this big around that was beautifully carved. It was nicely brass. So he said, I'm going to take it. And I said, well, okay, Captain, if you can take it, I'll find something. <laughs> and in this, in this welter of stuff on the floor, which is about knee deep, I found a tray enough to be 28 inches in diameter, black. And I thought, well, what the hell am I going to do with that? It's pretty heavy. But I took it back over to the other side of the company. And I talked to an Italian over there, and he, he built me a box, about square, <laughs> about the eighth inch, packed it in there. And I sent it home for a dollar and a half or through the mail. And I wrote to him, and I said, well, it's a pretty, I liked it. It was very uh, sort of classic, simple carving. And I said, eh, well, maybe we can have it re-silvered. All you need is some elbow grease because it's sterling. And did you clean it up? Oh yeah, it's been in our living room ever since. Good for you. I'm afraid someday somebody's going to come from Italy and I, we just happened. To... <laughs> <laughs> That's ours. <laughs> so, uh, how long did you stay at Lake Garden? About uh, a week. A week. And then we were shipped over to. Uh, was it up towards Bosnia and Serbia? Yes, we were right on the, on the on the Czech Italian border because the Tito's forces were right. they they were going to to reclaim land that all that's been disputed you know forever yeah. and they were going to reclaim that from Italy that uh, slab over there mm -hmm. next to to Yugoslavia and uh, so we were just there right in between them to stop the. But you weren't there that long, were you? Uh, there, we were there maybe two weeks at least, but maybe, maybe well, three. And did you engage in a lot of combat? None. No, not, I didn't no, think None at all. And our days were spent swimming in the river. And my job was to wander around and talk to, through an interpreter, talk to these partisans. Because they, they, I forgot all of the sequence, but the partisans with their green armbands would march in the morning. <laughs> and in the afternoon, the, uh, the, the communists, Yugoslav sympathizers, the, the Italians, they would march. They have red armbands. And I, our platoon job was to scout around, which we didn't very 
little up, but enough to find a few things to scout around and look for munitions that these partisans had stashed away and, and uh, arranged to have them destroyed and that sort of thing. We didn't find a heck of a lot. They were pretty good at hiding stuff. And then from there you left to go back to the States. Yeah. And you came back on, was it the West Point, was it? Yep. And tanned your way across the ocean? You came indeed, back tanned? Indeed we did. Uh, we went from, we went to, uh, took the 40 and 8s from, uh, well, up there, I don't recall what town, it must have been from uh, Venice or somewhere then, and mm -hmm. took those south, to, back to Naples, mm -hmm. and we were in Naples about three or four days, and then we got on the, what you just said, in, in, uh, the name of the ship. West Point. West Point. Yeah which was uh, an official, I mean, it was built for a troop ship. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't as bad going back as it was going over? Oh, going, coming back, the sweet sea was smooth as glass. Well, we, when we came over about uh, the end of July. Mm -hmm. Smooth as glass, we never spent an hour on down below decks. We were on deck, lying there, all the whole dang bunch of us. Now, I heard you arrived in New York slim, trim, svelte, and tan. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, 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 we arrived in, in, uh, in New York the day the, the first A-bomb was dropped, and that was mm -hmm. announced as we came past the Statue of Liberty. What was your feeling going past? Oh, man. I thought the ship was going to roll over, because all men on deck rushed over to the starboard side of the ship. I think mm -hmm. they, they, they the, the statue was on our... Yeah, New York and the statue was on our starboard side. So everybody went over there, and the ship, woo, and, and uh, an announcement came over the the, the uh, PA system. All men on deck get back in the middle of the ship. Because uh, we had so much weight <laughs> on, on one side of the boat that they, that they thought it was going to roll over. Did you feel like you were really home, though, when you saw that? When we really felt we were home was when he, we sailed up the the um, Hudson. Hudson to Camp Shanks. Uh -huh. And the ship anchored in the middle of the river and they had lighters, small boats that came out to carry us back. And as we got off that dang ship on that lighter, they had fresh milk. And then we knew we were home. Everybody got about two pints of fresh, cold milk and we hadn't had that since we left the state. Well, you know, since 9-11, Patriotism is you know, high. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you because I think can we because because you want to ask him some things yeah. about your father. I just yeah, yeah. go ahead. Well, I was going to say after we do that, why don't we turn the tape off and then start it again so we know where it goes. She wants to ask her ask you things just about her, about her father. And those things will not go to the library. Oh. So you just want me to shut off for now? No, no, let her just one page. page this, oh, you know how he, patriotism is so high. There was a lot of emotion. emotions. People were very e emotionally involved over the, the patriotism. Yeah. What was the feeling when you guys were on that ship and you were coming in to going right past the Statue of Liberty? I mean, was it overwhelming? Was it a. a well, it was a. You know, it always had been every time I come back, and I was really strong to see the flag again. Oh, really? You bet. I just, I, the only one, one thing, how would you, I think earlier you character got, characterized, I can't say it, what am I saying? Characterized. Thank you. <laughs> the group of men, these 28 men, how would you describe them? Incredibly good men, in any way you want to look at it. I never heard a complaint from any of them. They never questioned the, uh, anything that was asked of them. They were uh, worked like just clockwork together. They were very caring of each other. Uh, well, uh, yeah, at one point, 
after Mautner was killed, I'm trying to think which one his name was. Uh, when I came back to the to the to the unit, which was maybe a four or five or a week after, uh, something five to seven days, something like that, I came back to the outfit, and I noticed as we came up where there when I came up there and they were cooking French fries in their helmet, and one of these guys was sitting off the, off the side and said damn thing, and the rest of them say how are you doing, how are you doing, back and back, all that sort of thing. And he could remember his name. But he was sitting there not saying a word. And finally, a couple of the guys went over to him. We were going to break up or something. They went over and helped him up, and, and they walked away. But then I noticed them kind of herding him around after that. And I said, what, what's going on here? And he said, well, what was his name? He was a young guy, and he had looked upon Mautner almost like a father. Mm -hmm. What was his name? He's on your list? <sighs> yeah. It would be. They don't have that list here? Do we? No, I don't really know. But they, 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 they took him away, and he went back to the hospital. You know, I, don't know what, I don't remember what they came up with. But he, he, he was a true shell shock, or what now they call it uh, something trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's called a stress trauma, or I don't know, something like that. Oh, traumatic. Traumatic stress, yeah, I think. But, uh, yes. Uh, he just, he just, he wouldn't talk, and then he didn't talk, and then he just, he'd sit him down, and he'd stay right there until somebody would move him again. Mm -hmm. And it was sad, but uh, he just, he just thought that much of modern. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, do you want to ask? Yeah, yeah, so I don't.
probing. So these pioneers moving ahead and, and happening on the velvet here in the dark, feeling the ground. If they felt loose ground, then they would feel for these shoe mines. And then they'd move ahead and then they'd feel up above them for wires. Now if, these are kind of details, but if the wire's tight, you dare not cut it. And uh, all these guys carried pliers for cutting wires, and they also had a whole bunch of, we, we made, uh, made a big, uh, uh, like a safety pin out of stiff wire, and on that we put, uh, made uh, other pieces of short wire with a loop in the end so we could hang them on this safety pin. So we had a lot of these wires there for, for uh, uh, safety wires, because when the Germans set these things, they took the safety wires out so that if you pushed on them, they'd fire. So our guys, when they find these things, they'd take these wires and put it in the safety thing and bend it so that it wouldn't fire. And uh, anyhow, so this, is, uh, this was really tricky. And then they also carried white tape, rolls of white tape about an inch square. And as they'd go along and feel, they'd lay it down. Most of them do it on their hand or on their belly. And they'd lay this white tape on the ground. And that was the signal, the indication to the guys, the infantry but behind them, that this was a safe pass to follow through the minefield. And uh, believe me, they they stayed right on that path. And uh, so this, this is what the pioneers did. Once they got them through the minefields, well, then they just became a rifleman with the, with the rifle guns. Can I ask a question? You said that say when they were going up Belvedere, uh, you would have had two companies going up. Like two companies going up. Would that be like A and K? Yeah. And then the, the pioneers would be in front of them. Well, they, 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 yeah, they, they were they they led the companies through the mine. Right. Yeah. And then when you but this is what you did to get to the top of Belvedere. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And uh, oh no, that did you don't. lose any men going up Belvedere? Uh. There were there were three or four that were wounded and nobody killed. So you didn't have any mines take any of your men out. Didn't have what? You didn't have the mines that men hit the mines that blew them up or anything or killed them. No, they didn't. They didn't trip any mines. They didn't trip any. No. Uh, at least, well, at least my guys did. Your guys did not. No. Uh, some of the other. Uh, well, I was I was uh, hit just before daylight on there, because I was with the, with the colonel in the middle. I'm trying to think, it was I Company and L Company, no, yeah, I Company and L Company were the assault companies. K Company was in reserve that night. And uh, my guys were, were following the reserve, uh, following K Company with extra ammo. And Jack Walker was with them. The colonel wanted me on these assaults right with him so they could tell me to go bring my guys here or we needed mm -hmm. they needed more more people on uh, for mines or something like that or well what happened often is is that our guys once somebody got hung up in a minefield or got wounded or something of that to get them out i could our guys were sent to do that hey, we well, you became litter bearers then no we weren't litter bearers exactly but we drank, went by, we went in and, and, and felt our way into the minefield, got the wounded man and Finally. tried to drag him out the same way we came in, and then the litter guys would pick him then up. Then the litter guys would take, take him to an aid station? Yep. Okay. And how long did it take you to get to the top of Belvedere? Well, we left this, this line of departure, which was a, a road, so it came from uh, uh, Corchova, around the Gajo, Montana. We left that, uh, we crossed that line of departure at 11 o'clock at night. Was that on the 18th or on the 19th? That's the, the evening of the 19th. The evening of the 19th. February. Yeah, I And uh, we were on top by, oh, before daylight. Before daylight. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. In my case, I was with uh, let's see, uh, George Dorrington was the S2, I believe it was. He's a captain. He was the president. Uh, he was the uh, 
battalion, exactly. And uh, we, George and I, were with Colonel Sheeler. And we, everybody's crawling up, and there's lots of machine gun and mortar fire. Because these uh, tracers were just streaming over our heads. Everybody's flat on the ground. And uh, we came upon this column of men just uh, head to toe. And Sheeler just said, uh, uh, Gordon can help me get those men up on top. Well, I don't know who they were. Like, I think they were, must have been Elk or maybe I come and got men. Anyhow, they were just, just frozen there, and rightly so, I think, because it was it was really hell. The, uh, you see these pictures of the guys crawling and training under machine guns that are safely protected. Well, we were underneath machine gun fire, which is about 18 inches off the ground, crossing right over our heads, doing this sort of thing. So uh, George and I just took off sliding up on our belly past these guys and got up ahead of them and said, come on, follow us, which they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, George and I did our bit, tried that. And where was Jim Barr in this? How did he fit in this? Because he was... Well, I read Jim Barr and he... He, uh, he was S3, was he? Yeah. Okay. I think it was S3 or S2. I don't know. Uh, he was an intelligence officer. Exactly. Would he have been involved in this? He, he went, he, he led I Company up to short above the, the, the uh, line of departure a ways, and then my good friend uh, uh, Butch Luther told him to, he, okay, we'll take it from here. And, and Jim backed off. And then Butch, I think that's why those I Company people that I saw that were that were getting nowhere because Butch had just gotten up on top and was promptly killed. Uh, yep, he uh, he was pinned with him right between the eyes. So he's killed him. So was he the and Butch Luther? What was his position? Was he, he was I Company commander. He was I Company. Who would have taken over for him? I think Ken Eggleston did. Was wasn't Eggleston in in L Company? Well, he was in L and then he was also in M, but I. Well, Ken Eggleston took, was replaced uh, April the 12th and went to M Company April the 12th. My father took over for Ken Eggleston. I, uh, yes, but... Uh, but who would have no, been... Oh, wait a minute, no. April... Was it England? Yeah. No, no, that was on, that was on, uh, on 9-13 when... Uh, that was on the 14th of April. Yeah, it was later, was it? Yeah. But anyway, I don't want to hold you up. I just thought maybe you knew who replaced him. Who replaced him? Uh, Luther. Luther? God, I can see him, but I... Uh, I can't think I'm sorry. I company. Yeah. Who was company to invite you? I know Kay was... What? Cooper. Kay right. was Cooper. Right. Cooper. 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 You got to the top of the mountain at about 11 o'clock. Well, no, no, no. 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 We got it. We got up there. Early morning. Yeah, early. That's no. which would be your um, You start at what? At 11 o'clock? We start at 11 o'clock at, at night. night. Yeah. And you got there early morning. And uh, yeah, they, we were on top there by uh, 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock. Something like that. What'd you do when you got up there? Well, I had no more than gotten up on top and. Uh, George Dorings and I were flattened out against the side. We'd been, there was a machine gun, a, 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 a machine gun position up above us. George and I got there and so he and I sneaked up to it as far as we could do and it was very steep. And there was a slot that they were firing out of. And so I got on my knees and heaved a grenade up and it, because uphill, it hit short, and then hit and started immediately rolling back down and rolled right down between us and exploded right behind us. George told me later, said, you son of a bitch, you tried to kill me that <laughs> I, and He said, I could feel, still feel this way 20 years later when he, he visited California. He said, I can still feel the slap of that grenade against the bottom of my feet. But uh, anyhow, I got one in after that. 
and the machine gun quit. But then we, the whole hillside exploded. We came on the most tremendous mortar barrage you could imagine. It was there was just you couldn't distinguish between bursts. It was and it went on and on. Who was firing on you? Germans. The Germans were firing on you. But weren't there old men on top of that hill? No, they pulled off the back. Oh, they so we're just the Americans up there. I thought it was. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, we were plastered against which against which I thought was a was a rock outcrop. But last time I was over there I realized that wasn't a rock outcrop at all. That's the that's the ruined basement of the base of what had been a, a, a little little church up on top or a monastery or right, church, some, something up there. Yeah, it was a ruin. There's a ruin. Yeah, there's a ruin up there. But it's wiped out. Yeah, and there were just low wall remnants. But hey, we we're plastered against that, trying to avoid the, all this crap coming. Excuse me, coming down on us or all of there. And then I made the mistake of trying to get up and run to a, another hole, and that's when I was hit. You were hitting Belvedere? Yep, right on top of Belvedere. And how, when you were hitting Belvedere, how did they get you down off of Belvedere? Well, when they played, they, uh, uh, I remember Danny Fantoni was the uh, K Company aid man who came over and patched me up. Boy, you can't say enough for aid man. I'll tell you, those were guys were incredible because everybody was lying flat and they were moving around uh, patching people up. And he came up and he cut a big rip in my new combat pants and uh, I thought it was going to freeze my leg. It was a cold night. So uh, so I, after I, when I was hit, I just a couple of steps and I flopped into a hole and lo and behold there was a German soldier in there. And he was a kid, uh, I can't have been 18 years old. I can still see his great wide eyes. He was scared spitless. He wasn't wearing a helmet. And he and I looked at each other, it seemed like a long time, but it, probably just a second or two. And I wasn't about to shoot him, and apparently he wasn't about to shoot me, and they, he just hopped up and ran back. Mm -hmm. Disappeared. And so I stayed in that hole for until that mortar barrage quit, and then and it got to be pretty daylight, and then I started sliding back down the hill on my rear end, keeping my foot up ahead of me. And I was sliding down, and the first thing I heard was some guy off my right down, hey, Lieutenant, stop, 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 stop. Well, I look over there, and the guy said, mines. And I looked down the hill. I was about to slide right into some of these the wires of these post mines. So they came over. One of them was, uh, Roger Newhall, I don't remember who the second guy was. And they helped me limp back down to the aid station. And they went back up and did their job. So how long were you out of commission? I was out, I was in the hospital in Pistoia's 70th General Hospital, which was a wonderful Could you say that again? Please? 70th General 70th. Hospital. You, and, you need some refreshments, Chuck? I'm fine. <laughs> and uh, the 70th General was a wonderful, it, the entire St. Louis University Medical School had been formed into a general hospital. The dean of the school was the colonel in command. All of the surgeons were captains and they were uh, professors of surgery. And the, Nurse, I remember the nurse that opened up when I opened up my eyes. When I finally, it took quite a long time to get back to Pistoia to the hospital. I, from, they probably moved me off the mountain about 10 o'clock in the morning or something like that. By the time I went through the regimental aid station, the division, and then they on back to Pistoia. I didn't get back to the hospital there until probably midnight. And, and you were wounded all the time. Yeah. And did it? Did, did, one of the things I've always wondered, if you're wondering, does it ever get to the point where it doesn't hurt anymore? I don't remember it hurting. You don't remember it hurting? Huh. Uh, it did. I couldn't move my leg, but uh, no, I don't remember it hurting. And, and uh, I know that they given me a shot of morphine, so that... Did, it, did, was it the morphine, or just that it did not hurt? 
I don't know. It didn't. It didn't. Uh, it was just like I'd been kicked in the leg. That's all I know. And, and it didn't. Uh, Do you solve problems on the stay? Uh. Oh, yeah. So you get to the hospital, and how long were you in the hospital? I was there for a month. A month. So then that means that they send you back to the 10th? On about the 15th of March. And 15th of March. And see, this is this right. This thing here, uh, I was still gone from the company. But where was where was your pioneers? Well, who took over for you while you were gone? Jack Maltner. Oh, so there was no lieutenant? Mm -hmm. No. So you pick them up? My God, they kept my job for me. Yeah. So you pick them up the 15th of March, where are they? They are at, uh, uh, behind Dallas Bay. Dallas Bay. And, and so what's I, going on then? I was mad as hot because about uh, a week or maybe a little less before I was discharged from the hospital, oh, about three or four, maybe five guys from the platoon. And that was really neat. They had gotten leave to Pistoia and they came into the hospital to visit me. And I'm sure Bob was one of them. But they had sad news that Jack Mautner had been killed. And that's it. When I heard about it and learned about it, it was totally, totally uh, unnecessary. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I want to talk about the you idiot. Want, idiot. Why don't you talk about it? Because we might be able to find his descendants and they may be able to have his teeth. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it. Well, then me, you know. Oh, you mean Mockner? Yeah, let's talk. Can you talk about his death? No, because I wasn't there. But yeah. I can tell you from what the guys tell me. Why don't you death. talk about that? But I, uh, because the assistant division command, uh, assistant battalion commander, who in my view was totally incompetent, he had sent Mockner and a crew of six eight men on the forward slope of Dallas Bay in the middle of the afternoon on a clear day to reconnoiter a road and perhaps if it, if it needed repair shell holes or something for, so that uh, traffic and trucks and whatnot could get on that road to repair it. The stupidest thing that ever happened. He would, he would, he would send these men out right where the Germans had a broad view of him. And the Germans let him let him get out there in this open, on that road, and they lowered a boom. Were they all killed? No, they weren't killed, but Mautner was killed, and at least four of the men were seriously wounded. These were all pioneers? They were all pioneers, yeah. Do you want to say who the assistant battalion commander's name was? You bet I do. Who was it? It was Eric Wickner. Wickner. How do you spell that? W-I-C-K-N-E-R. What do the guys think of him? They thought the same thing and I do, that the, they, that the guy was an idiot. Was there any reason why he gave for doing that? Oh, I have no idea. No, he, you never spoke to him about it. Well, uh, the last time, I, I, he, uh, he took over the battalion when, when uh, Sheeler was, was uh, wounded when we were crossing the toll. But I really had ever, never had anything to do with him. Did you ever talk to Schiller about it? No, he wouldn't no. talk about that. He wouldn't talk about it. Okay. That isn't that kind of thing that they discussed? But uh, all of this here is Wickner stayed in the... He, he started with the 87th at Fort Lewis and got up to be a major somehow or another. And then he stayed in the Army in another 20 years or so. Hmm. And he retired as a major. Oh, that's interesting, because you usually are in charge of people. Well, anyway, so you get back to Dallas Bay, you get back to your men. Yeah, I got back to you, and they're cooking French fries. They're cooking French fries? <laughs> but who was taking the place of uh, 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 Sergeant? Jesse Spencer. Jesse Spencer. Yeah, he'd been a, a sergeant uh, head there. He wouldn't have been my choice, but uh, at that time, I, he had been appointed. So this was like 15th of March, and the 15th of March, because you're getting ready to go into another battle. Well, yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't do a heck of a lot. Uh, we built a forward OP because the uh, colonel and even the general on the forward slope of Dallas Bay, rest assured, we did it at night. Uh, but we fortified a house, used our explosive to draw, knock down a big 
big, uh, what kind of tree was that? A sycamore or something like that. About as big as this tabletop. With a huge charge of explosive. This up on this side of the tree and was down on this side. When it went off, it just sheared it off. But why would you have done that? Did you need to go through there? Well, it was blocking our view. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> It made an awful noise in the middle of the night. Uh, that's when Jack Brevard dang near killed me because uh, he'd been one of those guys. We, we when we were doing this work on this house, filling it full of sandbags, uh, well, we always put outposts out to, to warn us of any incoming traffic. And uh, Jack Brevard, I went out to check him. I came around the haystack, and Jack Brevard was just about to have this grenade in his hand, and just about to lob it at me. And he's, oh, excuse me, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. Okay, so then, from this point on, was the next big thing up there in Castle Diana, up there on the 12th and the 11th, is that the next push that you were involved in? On the 14th of April. 14th of April. Because well, well, it was supposed to start the 12th, wasn't it? But the weather was bad. Yeah, and the airplanes couldn't come in and do their. And then they, then Roosevelt also died. Yeah, that's right. And they, because there wasn't there some discussion that it was really because of the weather, but they said it was Roosevelt. Was that? Well, uh, the weather when we pushed off, the weather was beautiful. And uh, then uh, there again on that day, we had the same position. The two. The the forward company and we're in the And this would have been the fifteenth you're talking this about. This is on the fourteenth of April. Yes, okay, fourteenth. Yeah. Because I think your original orders were to push off on the twelfth. Could be. But it was pouring rain and miserable. Well, I don't remember that. I that. just read that someplace. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was in April and it probably had been because that was mm -hmm. soggy so it was the fourteenth that you pushed off. Yep. And what was your objective? And what was the objective of the final year? Well I don't know. It's the same dang deal. We we were to stay, and in this case, we, well, the setup was the same. We had the same. Can we stop the interview so we can get? You want to get through? We're doing an interview. Yeah. Well, we yeah. come through here. Yeah, well, it's yeah, sure. Once, yeah, I think we have to catch the transport oh. up to it because it's some place that you can't hey, get to. I've got a car, and if need be, I can get you up there. Okay, because it's evidently. It's downtown. Oh, I thought you said there was no parking or something. No, well, it's downtown. And it right, it's dip parking is difficult. But, but, and, but let's let's say your dessert. Okay. Are you big on dessert? My what? Are you a big dessert person? <laughs> Can we, when they start, you know, once it's decided that this A and P platoon had to be created or organized? Well, because they changed the they changed the division table of organization from a light division to a standard division. And the standard division had uh, a Pioneer platoon in battalion headquarters company. We didn't have that in the light I division. You didn't have, you know, at that point it had to be exposed. Oh, you have it on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, see, that's very interesting. Yeah. And the other thing that I wanted to ask was when you, you had those pack boards, were there any times that you carried like big crates up on your shoulders? Did they ever do? You mean without a pack board? Yeah. No. No. Not that I can recall. No, because they, because that's that's sometimes that's the way that uh, artillerymen, they particularly if they had a stack over here and they're going to bring it over the gun, mm -hmm. they pick up a couple of rounds and pack them that way. But we were following these troops all the time, and and then also during the an assault, then. Our guys might have to go back and load up again and bring them up to the to the rifle. And the pack cords were the way to carry the biggest loads. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I was just curious if that was the only way of carrying it. Well, it's probably it, the safest and and the best for your back as well. Yeah, but we couldn't. On now, once we got in the flat ground, well, then we didn't have to do that. We just had to load it up on a jeep, take it up. Well, when you were saying about that advanced ammo depot, you, was it just that one spot, or did you go up that mountain and leave at various spots? No, no. Ammo, just one? One spot. One central. Right in the middle of it. This was our area that we were to go up and have one company over here, one company over here, and then the, the, the reserve company would be following up in the middle. We put it as close to the middle as we could get it. Exactly. And if the idea was to have it all up there as close as possible, so that when we needed it, it wasn't too far behind us. 
Well, you guys were fortunate that those Germans never found them. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you bet. Well, they're so, all... And so then this platoon just operated as its own entity. It was never really divvied out to anybody else or joined up with anybody else except with what you said at times. Maybe they needed support. Maybe yeah, you well, sent that's, a that, couple that's, guys. Yeah, we were, we were there to... Our main job in combat was was mines, besides ammo, ammo supply. And then you got involved in the fighting then as well? I should hope to tell you. <laughs> Pretty brutal. Yes. Interesting. I find it so, it's just very interesting. Hmm. Well, are we ready to yeah, break now? Yeah, why don't we break because uh, we probably used okay. to... We ended right at the end of the session and I'm not sure I fully, I don't know if it was explained. I don't understand when you were saying about everybody else moved off and, and the pioneers had to stay. No. Oh, okay. Maybe should. Would you start there? So no, I, 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 I think, Why don't you start with 913? Yes, because yeah. I, I kind of, I, I think, think a lot of people are confused by 913. Really? Well, yeah. A yes. lot of people hit 913. They're not sure what it was, and so. Are, are you? And, are we on? Yeah. Go okay. For it. Because I think that nine hill, hill th 913. They took various hills. The third battalion took hill 913. Yeah, that was our uh, objective. That's correct. You know, maybe I should move so that he's not. I'll move over to that corner so the mouse so can stare, stare over here. There you go. Um, and so why don't you tell us, 913 start was they jumped off on the 14th. So why don't you tell us who the key players were, where the pioneers were? Yeah. Well, uh, let me think. Um, first of all, on the on the morning of of nine of uh, the 14th of April. <coughs> It was unlike Belvedere, it was a daylight attack. Our, uh, we were supposed to cross the line of departure from the, the front companies at 9.45. Well, starting about, I don't remember the times exactly, but starting about, uh, well, I would say, 8 o'clock, the uh, Air Force airplanes came in. B-40, or no, P-47s and uh, I just remember P-47s. And they plastered this row of hills across from to the north of, of Dallas Bay with uh, napalm, you know, just, they, they dropped this bomb and this huge cloud of fire and, and smoke would come up. And then another plane would come in and they'd bomb and they'd rocket. And pretty soon that whole hillside over there was nothing but a mass of dust. And this, this went on for maybe 30 minutes. And then the airplanes disappeared, and then our own artillery started up, and they plastered those hills over there. And uh, we were, some of us were looking at this from OPs and whatnot. Couldn't figure out how anybody could survive that, how they could live in what had just happened over there. And this, so this, then that, the artillery quit about 9 o'clock or something like that. And then our guys pushed off of the hill. Now, we came off of the west side of... Uh, of Della Spade, this was the third battalion, and there was a, it's called Pra del Bianco Basin. Mm -hmm. Like this. That's right, and it's just a, it's just a valley between Della Spade and, 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 this, and steep, and this down this little creek, mm -hmm. and then back up across open mm -hmm. uh, cultivated fields, across a little road up there between Pra del Bianco and, the, and around the corner, and on up to 913, the hill, and you know this hill is, when you look out there now, it's pretty unimpressive. It's, Is that right? Oh yeah, it's uh, gosh, it's just, it's just like a walk in the park, really, mm -hmm. as far as down into that rather steep valley and then back up across these fields. Except that this this road that went around below, around, there was a little little uh, group of houses called uh, Famatisi, mm -hmm. and uh, later on that was our battalion aid station, but. We passed that and went on this road, and it was really quite quiet. I mean, like once again, the pioneers were following between the two lead companies. And do you remember who they were? Who? The lead companies. Did we say it was L and something? I, I know it was L, and I, I thought it was L and, L and K. Well, which one was uh, Dolan? Dolan was with I. So, because that's where he got hit. 
Yeah, he got hit down just after he crossed the bottom and just barely started up the valley. Oh, wait, wait, the I Company was at least there. Uh, yeah, oh, yes, and yes, indeed they were. Uh, maybe it was I and L with K and Reserve again. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. And maybe that figures because they, they, they rather quickly committed K Company, so it turned out to be a whole, all three companies were committed. But uh, once you get across this little steep little gully and then start up across these open fields, that's where it became a killing field because they had wonderfully established cross uh, machine gun, machine, machine gun crossfire. And that, that shelling and airplane attack and all that didn't seem to affect it one bit. They got down on, they were down in the holes, and when this all quit, they just popped up, and there they, there they are waiting for us again. And so, getting out of there and up, up, up across that valley was, uh, as I say, it was just, just a slaughter. And um, so L and I, and well, they were there all, because my old, uh, in K Company, my old uh, platoon sergeant, uh, Mac McCarthy was killed there just on the slope of 913. So I know the K Company was, was involved in, in that. But um, it just took forever for them, for the companies to push across and get up that, that valley so that uh, we were, the pioneers were in a column had come and passed by Mount Femetisia. We got down on that road probably about, uh, I guess, maybe 10.30 to 11 o'clock. And we were supposed to take, go right straight ahead up that hill and pack up more ammo and bring it up between the attacking companies up on 9.13 and 8 something. Up. And uh, we, in order to try and stay out of, some, out of the line of fire as much as possible from on the left, there was Mont Belgaro, mm -hmm. which was, as far as we knew, nobody was working on it. And the, the artillery and the uh, 4.2 mortars were trying to smoke that to keep the observation from our left flank. So we were kind of going around 913, this one, this is the Pioneers, and we were going to, because our, our um, approach with our uh, ammo and where we wanted to, to have the, um, mules who are right behind us are a company of mules wanted them to dump in that that little draw which sort of went up in the middle around the corner into up to 913. well we got up across this field finally just going like hell yeah. i asked you you it was machine gun fire was it uh, mortars as well that were oh yeah there, there a lot of you know a lot of smaller uh, machine gun machine pistol uh, rifle fire did you have mines there too my guys had already opened tracks so, there was open. so when we when the rest of us came came along behind we were able to see that see the tape and we could just zip right up through that mm -hmm. and then we got up but we got up in this little draw and in the meantime the, the second battalion who was take, supposed to take the hill, there's kind of a basin back there. 913 in the basin, and then this hill over here. And the second battalion was supposed to capture that hill. Well, that, that's our friend, uh, Stone Battalion. Mm -hmm. And he was hiding somewhere in a hole somewhere, and then they just got hung up down there uh, on the road. And they, they, didn't, they didn't come up and do their job. So our left flank and our right flank was all exposed. And so when, when pioneers, anyhow, we got up in this little draw, and obviously a, a art, artillery observer who was still up here on this hill up here just zeroed in on us, and it was a three-gun gun battery, and I think they were, because later on I looked at one of the shell holes where a dead hit, and I think it was a 105 battalion, I mean a battery, because they'd fire three rounds, and, it, and so we dived into these holes that the Germans had dug previously, and the shells just started coming in. It was just zip, 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 zip. And there'd be a 10 second interval. And then here'd come three more. And this went on for most of an hour. We couldn't stick our heads up. I, in fact, I was concerned there was a 
and I was in the hole with John Stokes. And uh, Johnny got kind of nervous, but I don't blame him. But there was a tree, stub with a tree sticking up, and I was scared to death of that that shell was going to hit the tree. We'd get an air burst and kill us in the hole. But anyhow, so we stayed in there well, almost an hour. One of them mentioned John Stokes is that in the time of this, it, the shells were hitting so close, apparently there was enough of relief that they couldn't depress to quite, quite hit us. Mm. And the shells were coming out, they, they just flash over that hole and, it, and they would burst. Well, the closest was from here to that pile. And whenever these things would explode, they just lift you up off the ground. And, and, uh, Did that? Here, 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 here. Dad was there too. Did that affect your hearing? Well, it's had a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. I had I had already some pretty serious damage. In it. This was back in when we were waiting to get in OCS, and I was supposed to. All of us were supposed to fall in. Mm -hmm. uh, we we're all. That's another story. We were we were OCS students, and prior is this all right? Talk about sure. That? Yeah. Sure. No. This is this is what we want. <laughs> prior to. Uh, 1943, all OCS graduates, whenever they graduate, they're automatically commissioned. Mm -hmm. Well, the Army at this time had found out that what we were being taught in OCS was World War I tactics, trench war, warfare, and knowing about uh, Avatar, and these, these crazy things that they used in World War II. It, it didn't affect World War, I mean World War I, it didn't affect, have anything to do with World War II. And so how, what the Army was doing to try and, and, and uh, correct that situation was bring these new le lieutenants previous to Fort Benning for what they called uh, uh, basic officer training. And they gave them all the new stuff that uh, they needed in World War II. Well, of course, if you, ha if you have a bunch of officers in there and you've got some other officers instructing them, you really can't lean on them very hard. So they, when we graduated in 43, and this was all, all over the country there. They graduated us as enlisted men, and we sat, and as this, in my case, in, my, in the University of Nebraska, we sat down in Fort Riley, Kansas, in, in tents out there in the middle of the Kansas heat. It was miserable. But uh, there were guys from Minnesota and, and uh, Iowa, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, all these uh, land grant universities that had ROTCs. And so we went to the, well, I, while we were waiting, at least in my case, we were waiting with a bunch of us in, in Kansas at Fort Riley. And we weren't assigned anything particularly, we were just waiting. And so they, they put us to work on KP and they put mm -hmm. us to work cleaning the, the police and the grounds and, and or uh, the marching all morning or, you know, just make work stuff. But they never knew where you were. And so when I, we would come out, I soon learned that if I would come out and fall in for the morning count, and then once you were assigned to some place, that's where you're supposed to go, but I never did. I just went over and I fell in with whatever group was going to the rifle range. And I'd go out to the rifle range and I'd lie out there all day. I'd get a helmet liner full of ammunition. And I'd lie out there and I'd shoot some poor bugger down there in the pits out there. Was, holding up the flag on my <laughs> and spotting my targets. And I never went to the, I never went back there to, to be a target spotter. I just stayed at the end of the line and I'd take a nap and then I'd, <laughs> and I'd, and then I'd shoot some more. Well, I did that all day for weeks. And I, I without any hearing aid or plug, oh, you know, plugs nice. or anything. So I'm quite sure that was the start, start of, of all this. Because I fired thousands of rounds. And I'm sure that being on, up there 913 didn't help it with these. Well, and then uh, before that on, on Belvedere, which mm -hmm. was was hellacious shelling. Mm -hmm. and, uh, then on 913. Anyhow, so back to 913. So, so you're in the foxhole. Guns we're right out right there, there and then the shells are going right over our head. And uh, at one point, John, Johnny Stokes got, he, he, he's kind of a nervous guy. He said, I can't stand it. I got to get out. I got to. And he stood up in the hole. And I reached up and I grabbed the old T-shirt right here. Get out. Yanked him down, and with that, I saw a shell zip across, which would have taken his head off. Mm. It was that close. Oh my goodness! Do you remember where Jill's father? Remember Jill's father there at all? Well, yeah, he was in one of the holes. Mm -hmm. I don't know with, with whom. But. Can you tell us about that? 
But you had no communication from one hole to another. Well, no, you? but when it was, every time we get a get a get, we would keep yelling back and forth. Anybody hit? You okay? And that sort of thing. And did you get anybody hit? No, no one so. Isn't that wonderful? And finally, we were counting these things, and these three rounds had come in, boom, 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 boom and, and, and all had come in again. But they, after an, about an hour, I guess, they start to slow down. Because this is the main approach for all the activity. So they slowed down enough, and pretty soon we were counting, and there was 10.